The United States is developing a new air-to-ground missile and it's designed just for China. Although the US military hasn't exactly said its new stand-in attack weapon, or SEOR for short, is meant for China, they are one of the very few countries that pose the types of threats that the SEOR is designed to deal with. Today we're going to explore integrated air defense systems and the threats they pose to military aircraft. We will see why weapons such as the SEOR will give the United States the ability to strike deep into enemy territory and destroy even the most sophisticated air defense systems. We will learn how the SEAL will protect non-stealth aircraft and why it will allow the United States to dominate the skies in the event of a war with a major military power such as China. Let's start by talking about modern air defense systems and why they are so dangerous to American aircraft. The concept of an integrated air defense system was first devised in 1936 by British Air Marshal Hugh Dowding. During the First World War, Britain protected London from Zeppelin attacks by surrounding the city with three concentric rings. The outer ring consisted of searchlights and anti-aircraft artillery. The second ring was comprised of fighter aircraft. The innermost ring contained more searchlights and anti-aircraft weapons. Air Marshal Dowding changed all that. In his eyes, Britain would be best protected by establishing a single command center where information could be centralized and orders given out to multiple units to jointly protect a section of airspace. The best example of the Dowding system, as it later became known, is the Battle of Britain during the Second World War. In 1940, Germany was seeking to gain air superiority in preparation for a potential invasion of the British Isles. Over the course of the nearly four-month campaign, Germany lost 1,900 aircraft before finally accepting the fact that it would never gain air superiority. Such losses were largely the result of the Dowding system. Information from observation posts and radar installations was collected in a filter room. That information was relayed to Fighter Command, who plotted the projected path of the incoming bombers and directed fighter aircraft to intercept them. That isn't very different from the integrated air defense systems today, at least in theory. An incoming threat is first detected by radar and other sensor equipment. The threat is then eliminated based on that information, often with anti-aircraft missiles. Speaking of anti-aircraft missiles, did you know that the first such system was developed in the early 1950s? The American MIM-3 Nike Ajax could intercept aircraft flying as high as 70,000 feet. It had a range of 30 miles and flew at twice the speed of sound. The Ajax carried three high-explosive warheads, one in the nose, one at the center of the missile, and one in the aft of the rocket. The warheads would detonate when the missile reached the predicted path of the aircraft. Over the years, integrated air defense systems have become more and more sophisticated. They are so effective that most aircraft cannot operate in contested airspace these days. Fourth-generation aircraft such as the F-14, F-15 and F-16 must keep their distance out of fear of being shot down. The threat is so great that even some stealth aircraft may be at risk at closer ranges. Several countries have developed homegrown integrated air defense systems over the years, even those you might not suspect, including Iran. The operational range can vary. Israel's Iron Dome has a range of 43 miles, which might sound somewhat short, but it's quite sufficient for its needs. Other countries such as Russia and China have developed systems that can detect and intercept aircraft at very long distances. For example, the Russian S-400 Triumph integrated air defense system is said to be able to identify and track 36 targets at the same time at distances up to 249 miles. It can not only engage aircraft at such distances, but it can also take out precision-guided cruise missiles, such as the American Tomahawk, at a range of 25 miles. The S-400 is a great example of a modern integrated air defense system. It is comprised of a 55K6E command post, a 91B6E acquisition and battle management radar, a 92N6E fire control radar, and up to 12 separate launch vehicles that carry up to four missiles each. In other words, a networked S-400 system can fire up to 48 missiles at incoming threats. All of the components are mounted on wheeled vehicles, allowing them to be moved easily to other locations. Its impressive range will keep enemy aircraft far away, preventing them from carrying out missions. Not to be ignored, China's long-range HQ-9 is quite powerful as well. The HQ-9 has been described as a combination of the American Patriot system and the Russian S-300, the predecessor to the S-400. The system can detect incoming aircraft at a range of 125 miles and engage targets 77 miles away. 
The HQ-9 can be used against a variety of targets, including low-flying aircraft, helicopters, cruise missiles, air-to-ground missiles, and tactical ballistic missiles. It is a shoot-and-scoot platform, which gives it the ability to change its location quickly after firing upon a target. The number of components associated with a battery is up to debate, but includes a command vehicle, a control systems vehicle, a search radar, a target control system, and six launch vehicles, each with four missiles apiece. It's common for four batteries to work together, bringing the total number of missiles to 96. There have also been reports of a new variant of the HQ-9 that has a longer range and better sensor equipment, including a dual-mode, semi-active radar homing and scanning infrared seeker. It has a 180kg warhead with a proximity fuse and can fly at speeds of up to Mach 4, making it incredibly hard to intercept. The HQ-9 is a potential nightmare for the US military, even more so because of a chain of artificial islands China is building in the South China Sea. The Great Wall of Sand, as it's become known, is comprised of seven artificial islands that were constructed by dredging vast amounts of sand and placing it on top of reefs above and below the water. They were then concreted to prevent erosion. Some of these artificial islands are more than 620 miles from mainland China and are being militarized. China has placed a wide range of offensive and defensive systems on these islands, including HQ-9s, anti-ship missiles, and laser and jamming equipment. There's even a 1.87-mile-long airstrip on Fiery Cross Reef that can be used by surveillance planes, fighter jets, and some bombers and cargo planes. These islands serve as an outer protective shield against attacks against the mainland, including ports that can be used for an invasion of Taiwan. They also pose a significant threat to the US Navy, whose ships will need to remain far out to sea until these defensive emplacements are destroyed. And that brings us back to why the US Air Force is developing the stand-in attack weapon. With SEOR, the United States will have a powerful weapon that can overcome even the most sophisticated air defense systems leaving China susceptible to the full military might of the US Air Force and Navy. It doesn't matter that the HQ-9 can be relocated to a different position relatively quickly, the SEAL will still hunt it down and destroy it. Even if an operator shuts down system components to avoid detection, SEAL is going to find them and get them. That's not good news for China. SEAL is, as the name suggests, a stand-in weapon. That means it's designed to be launched within protected enemy airspace. With SEAL, American stealth aircraft can penetrate contested airspace and come within range of targets that need to be eliminated, and those targets do not need to be close by. SEOR is a long-range missile, and stealth aircraft add to that range. If SEOR can reach it, it can destroy it. Design and deployment of the SEOR will take less time than most new weapon systems. That's because its basic structure is modeled on a new missile being designed for the US Navy, the Advanced Anti-Radiation Guided Missile Extended Range or Argum ER for short. If you aren't familiar with the extended range Argum, you should be. It's quite a powerful weapon itself. The Argum ER is a long-range air-to-ground radar hunting missile developed by the US Navy for its FA-18 Super Hornet, EA-18 Growler, and carrier-based stealth F-35C aircraft. It can also be used by the Air Force's fleet of F-35As. The concept of the Argum ER is simple. It's meant to take out enemy air detection systems by homing in on enemy electronic transmissions produced by radars, jamming devices, and radio signals. Once a target is identified, the missile adjusts its trajectory and destroys it with devastating effect. It's primarily meant to be used against ground targets, but can also hit moving vehicles and ships. Designed by a subsidiary of Northrop Grumman, Alliant Tech Systems, the development of the Argum ER began in 2016, Testing began in 2021 and concluded in 2023. Deliveries are scheduled to begin in early 2024, with the missile becoming fully operational shortly thereafter. So far, the US military has ordered 118 missiles. Other countries, such as Australia, have also placed orders. Australia has ordered 63 missiles and Finland is interested in acquiring 150. The Netherlands has confirmed that it too will purchase the missile for its F-35s. The missile is about 13 feet long, weighs 467 kilograms, about 1,000 pounds. It includes a multi-sensor guidance system with a passive digital guidance head, active millimeter radar, and a GPS and inertial navigation system. It uses a smokeless solid propellant and can fly at Mach 2. The Argum ER uses a passive anti-radiation homing receiver, a millimeter wave radar, a GPS, 
and an inertial navigation system to identify a target and guide the missile to the target. The warhead uses Northrop Grumman's Lethality Enhanced Ordnance, or LEO, fragmentation technology, which reduces collateral damage while still packing a wallop. Why are we talking about the Argam ER? Because it's very relevant to the development of the Sea Or. The US Air Force had been following what the Navy was up to with the Argam for a while, and it liked what it saw. So much so that it started thinking about building a missile of its own that could take out a wide range of targets that wouldn't break the bank and could be developed quickly. Thus, the idea of the Sea Or was born. The missile would be designed for the F-35A and carried within its weapons bay so it doesn't interfere with the aircraft's stealth profile. Although the Air Force recognized that Sea Or could potentially be used by other stealth aircraft such as the upcoming B-21 Strategic Bomber, it is a weapon for the F-35 first and foremost. And it isn't meant to be a missile designed just to destroy air defense systems. While Sea Or will be able to do that and do it well, the Air Force wanted the missile to do more. It wanted a weapon that could take out a wide range of different targets. So when the Air Force submitted a budgetary request in 2018 to study its options, it laid out all of the things it wanted SEAL to do. It wanted an anti-access area denial weapon, or A2AD, that could be used against fixed and rapidly relocatable targets. In its budgetary request, the Air Force specifically mentioned integrated air defense systems, theater ballistic missile launchers, land attack and anti-ship cruise missile launchers, GPS jammers, and anti-satellite systems. It will also be able to sink moving ships as well as fixed assets such as command and control centers. In other words, the Air Force wanted a highly maneuverable air-to-ground missile that could target pretty much everything, even if it was moving, and it wanted the development to heavily leverage the design and technology being incorporated into Argam ER so that it could be developed and tested more quickly and at a lower cost. In 2020, the Air Force issued an RFI, Request for Information, to Northrop Grumman, L3 Harris, and Lockheed Martin to establish an integrated digital environment to design, develop, and test the initial increment of the SEOR system, and it wanted it to be done using digital engineering methodology. What is digital engineering? Digital engineering is a way to design things using computer simulations, modeling, advanced algorithms, and even artificial intelligence. With digital engineering, almost all aspects of a project can be built, reviewed, and tested without a physical prototype. It can be used to develop a wide variety of systems such as circuit cards, aircraft, and even intercontinental ballistic missiles. In recent years, the US Air Force has been very focused on digital engineering because it speeds up projects and allows for multiple partners to build components based on an initial design. It's for that reason that digital engineering was included in the RFI requirements. The advantages that Northrop Grumman had, such as its strength in digital engineering and the fact that it designed the Argam ER missile that SEAL was to leverage, ultimately led Lockheed Martin and L3 Harris to bow out of the competition. So in September 2023, the Air Force awarded a 700 million contract to Northrop Grumman to move forward with the project. Since SEAL is still being designed, there aren't many specific details regarding the missile. But based on what we do know, it looks like SEAL will be a game changer if war ever broke out between the United States and China. SEAL will be a modular platform, meaning that it will be possible to swap out components relatively quickly. It's not clear if the ability to change components will be used to tailor the missile for specific missions or simply make it easier to upgrade. Conceivably, it will do both. It will also feature open architecture interfaces to allow for subsystem upgrades to keep up with electronic improvements to the F-35 over time. SEAL will be a supersonic missile capable of speeds of at least Mach 2. It will be highly maneuverable, able to change course as needed with or without being controlled by the pilot. It will have hardened, low signature sensors, making it difficult to identify and intercept. SEAL will not be limited to seeking targets directly ahead of it. It will also be able to look for targets from either side and potentially behind it. Such technology already exists and is being used on the AIM-9X Sidewinder. It will also use a new warhead being developed at the start of the project. Since SEOR is meant to be used against many different targets, a fragmentation-based warhead, such as found on the Argam ER, may not be effective enough against all of the targets that SEOR is designed to destroy. One of the most interesting aspects of the SEOR is that it can be launched without a specific target in mind. Essentially, an F-35 pilot will be able to select a geographic area and allow the missile to pick out its target as it closes in. SEAL will also have a two-way data link 
that could provide the pilot with the option to select a new target area while the missile is in flight. It's even conceivable that with this data link, it can communicate with other missiles in flight and share targeting information that will be exceptionally helpful in directing standoff missiles that are fired outside of the range of air defense systems. Seor is the right missile at the right time. Tensions are increasing between the United States and China at an alarming rate. Some of the tension is centered around the artificial islands that China has built. China is declaring water and air spaces right around these islands, which the United States considers open waters. This has led to several incidents between the militaries of both nations, and neither side is backing down. But that's not all. The most likely scenario that would lead to a major conflict between the two powers is a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. Taiwan is an interesting story unto itself. It's part rogue province and part autonomous state. Although most of the global community does not consider Taiwan a country, most major powers maintain unofficial diplomatic and military relations with its government. Even Taiwan is a bit confused as to what it is. None of that matters because mainland China considers Taiwan as part of the People's Republic of China, and it wants it under its complete control. The level of Chinese saber-rattling is intensifying. China even released a documentary in 2023 about its state of readiness to invade Taiwan. In the event of such an invasion, would the United States defend Taiwan? Well, that's a good question. Officially, the United States has been very ambiguous as to what it would do if China attempted to invade Taiwan. Unofficially, it certainly would. We know that because US President Joe Biden has made direct statements that the United States would protect Taiwan. He hasn't been ambiguous about that at all. In a television interview in 2022, Biden was asked if the United States would defend Taiwan. His answer was yes. In any direct conflict with China, the United States need to gain air superiority early on. And that's a problem. As we've seen, the range and sophistication of China's defense network will make it extremely dangerous for American aircraft and naval vessels to operate anywhere close to Taiwan. That's where the Sea Or comes in. Because the stealth F-35 can penetrate enemy airspace, SEALs can clear a safe path for non-stealth strike aircraft to carry out their missions. Not only that, SEAL can take out a wide variety of other targets, including anti-ship launchers that will initially keep the US Navy out of the fight for Taiwan. An actual war between the United States and China is highly unlikely anytime soon. But if such a war does break out in the future, the US Air Force will be ready and able to deal a serious blow with SEAL. What do you think? Can the United States protect Taiwan from a Chinese invasion? How much of an impact will see or make in the event of a war between the United States and China? Please share your comments below. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to click the like button and subscribe for more military content and analysis from military experts. For all of the military advancements that China has made in recent years, it still can't compete with the US in one area, the skies. The US Air Force is a terrifying prospect for China for many reasons, not least because it knows that America leads the charge when it comes to the quality of its equipment and its pilots. And if war were to ever break out between the countries, China would find itself cowering before the might of America's craft. But why? China has a very strong military. It's the second largest military spender in the world, just behind the US and it's ramping up its nuclear capabilities with every passing year. But when it comes to the skies, China pales in comparison. And Beijing knows it. The reason for China's fear starts with one of the most crucial aspects of warfare, sheer numbers. The simple fact is that the US's airborne capabilities stretch far beyond anything that China can handle. According to Global Firepower, America has a little over 660,000 Air Force personnel. Of course, not all of these are pilots. The US doesn't have the ability to send a half a million strong death fleet of planes in China's direction, but what it does have is an extensive infrastructure of pilots and support crews that can coordinate massive offensives that would cause major problems for Beijing. That's not to say that China doesn't have an impressive number of personnel itself. The People's Liberation Army Air Force, PLAAF, has about 400,000 members. Impressive numbers though over 260,000 fewer than the US Air Force. Of course, it's not just people who make up an Air Force. Equipment is a vital component. That's where the US really comes out on top. It has a total stock of 13,300 aircraft, 9,975 of which are combat-ready, compared to China's fleet of 3,166. 
In other words, the United States has about four times the number of aircraft that China has, meaning it would easily overwhelm the PLAAF in terms of sheer numbers. Digging deeper, it's clear that China has focused most of its air force spending on fighter jets, with the country having 1,199 of these types of planes available. But even that impressive number pales in comparison to the United States, which has 1,914 fighters, along with a far more versatile fleet of planes that go beyond dogfighting capabilities. For instance, the US has 962 fixed-wing transports compared to China's 288. It also has far more planes available for training, with China having less than a sixth of the 2,634 craft that the US can use to give its next generations of pilots some much-needed flight experience. No matter where you look, be it attack planes, tankers, helicopters, or special mission planes, America comes out on top every single time. Its air-based firepower is on a level that no other military can match. The US simply has more options when it comes to moving its troops around and conducting air missions against China or its territorial partners. That's not to say that the PLAAF is useless. It would be able to cause some damage to America's forces, but for every plane that Beijing could down, the US would have plenty in reserve, ready to replace it. In a war of attrition, China's stock would run low far sooner, giving the US complete dominance of the skies. Still, sheer numbers aren't the only way that a battle is won. Quality of equipment is just as important, and what better place to look than the crown jewels of each country's fighters? For China, that crown jewel, at least right now, is the Chengdu J-20 Mighty Dragon, a stealth fighter that entered into service in 2018, following its maiden flight in 2011. It's a fifth-generation plane that was designed specifically to compete with America's F-22 Raptor. The plane is capable of a top speed of about 1,670 miles per hour and can fly for almost 2,800 miles before it needs to refuel. It has low jet engine intakes and is barely visible on a radar cross-section, making it ideal for sneak attacks. And it comes equipped with an active electronically scanned array AESA, that transmits targeting data directly to its firing systems. Speaking of those firing systems, the craft comes equipped with an internal cannon that can be deployed during close quarters combat. A pair of bays underneath the craft can hold several PL-10 air-to-air missiles, with another bay in its belly carrying larger PL-21 and PL-12CD missiles. In all, it's a flying death machine that can rain fire on an opponent through a combination of built-in guns and missile strikes, so it's no surprise that China is building as many as possible. Nikkei Asia even suggested that it built more J-20s in 2022 than the 187 F-22s that America manufactured, with plans in place to produce another 40 to 50 per year for the foreseeable future. Of course, not all of those craft will go straight into the PLAAF, with China having the opportunity to sell some. Still, it's an impressive fighter. And if its sole opponent in the US Air Force was the F-22 that it seems to have been built as a counterpart to, China would at least be able to claim parity with the United States. But it's not just the F-22 that China has to worry about. The F-35 is another of the US's best fighters, and the combined force of both would overwhelm the J-20. Where China is focusing most of its efforts on a single fighter, the US has two extremely advanced aircraft that give it more versatility. The F-22 is the closest to the J-20, with its top speed of about 1,500 miles per hour being just a smidge below the J-20s. It has an external radar cross-section, which makes it remarkably difficult to detect, and is able to supercruise. That means it's able to maintain supersonic speeds without the need for afterburners, making it even harder to detect. The thrust vectoring system built into the aircraft also makes it one of the most agile ever made. So, even if the J-20 is faster than the F-22, it may not be able to hit it. It's worth focusing on the ability to supercruise a little more for a simple reason. The J-20 can't do it. In fact, none of the fighters in China's stock can because they're all equipped with the WS-10 Taihang, a turbofan engine that delivers high thrust but can't maintain supersonic speeds without engaging afterburners. That's a problem for stealth operations. Whenever a craft engages its afterburners, it essentially gives the game away when it comes to its location. So for a J-20 to maintain supersonic speeds, it has to let the US know where it is. But for the F-22 and F-35, supercruising can be used to maintain high speeds with a large weapons load, while the craft itself 
essentially appears as barely visible on most radar systems. As for the F-35, it's actually a touch slower than both the J-20 and F-22, being capable of hitting a top speed of 1,200 miles per hour. However, it has slightly more advanced avionics, the tech inside the craft, than the F-22. Both have advanced systems that include radar, sensors, and communication systems. However, the F-35 adds to that with a helmet-mounted display, which can show the pilot real-time information about both their plane and the surrounding environment. But the standout feature of this plane is its ability to take off from a very short runway before landing vertically. In other words, it's able to operate from bases that don't have large runways, such as assault ships and smaller airfields. That's a capability that neither the F-22 nor the J-20 can match. And of course, both the F-22 and F-35 have similar weapon systems, with cannons and air-to-air -air missiles to match the J-20. In a straight comparison, the J-20 seems to come out just about on top, but the F-22 is very close, and when combined with the more versatile F-35, America would definitely have the advantage in pure dogfighting capabilities. And when you add the ability to supercruise into the mix, America's top fighters have a clear advantage over China's in the stealth game. In short, China knows that it's chasing the US when it comes to its fighters. The J-20 is a direct response to the F-22, and even China's experiments with unmanned flights ape those already conducted by the US. Beijing is playing catch-up. And while it's closing the distance, it's far from achieving air superiority based on numbers or equipment. Speaking of air superiority, China is also terrified of America's Air Force because it takes a very different approach to the PLAAF. China tends to focus on using its planes to support its ground troops, rather than to establish a superior presence in the skies. It's a similar approach to the one that Russia has tried to use in Ukraine, with planes flying low to take out ground-based targets. But this approach has two problems. First, it makes planes vulnerable. Providing support to ground-based troops means flying low, and the lower you go, the closer you get to anti-air defense. This is a lesson that Russia has learned quickly during its invasion of Ukraine, with Ukraine's anti-air defenses already being responsible for shooting down at least 130 craft by August 2023, according to RAND. The fact that China takes a similar approach will be terrifying to Beijing, because it means that it's tactically outmatched by the US. And when you consider the fact that the US has far superior anti-air equipment to Ukraine, the situation would only become more dire for China's pilots. Second, China's ground-focused approach naturally takes its focus away from the skies. That's where America could come swooping in to dominate China's airspace thanks to five letters, C-O-M-A-O. COMEO stands for Composite Air Operations, and the idea behind this tactic is to bring a versatile range of capabilities into a single airborne attack. Typically, that means several countries combining their forces and their craft in joint operations where one set of planes may provide ground support, for instance, another set may circle the skies, defending against any fighters that would draw near. The ultimate goal is to create one large package of aircraft that combines their forces to essentially take over several hundred square miles of airspace. A Comeo usually has a package commander, who coordinates the routes, timings, and targets for the aircraft, and because the package is so large, some Comeos incorporate up to 100 planes and helicopters, there is built-in redundancy. If a craft or a mission fails, there are others on hand to replace it and launch a secondary assault. This is a problem for China. With its planes generally focused on the ground, the US could use Comeo tactics to dominate the skies above. Its fighters will be able to launch aerial assaults, both on China's planes and targets on the ground, while the PLAAF would lose the ability to escape danger by gaining altitude because more American flyers would be stationed higher up to greet them. Combine all of this with the fact that Comeos usually bring together multiple countries, the US would likely involve NATO in its operations, and you get exceptionally coordinated attacks that far outstrip anything that the PLAAF can do. In short, the US would have complete air superiority. And even without support from other countries or NATO, America has such a versatile stock of aircraft that it could essentially launch Comeos on its own, with China having little recourse due to only coming close to matching the states in fighter plane numbers, with everything else falling behind. Versatility is clearly the key, and it's the lack of it that would have Beijing running scared if the US started launching complex aerial attacks 
combined with anti-air defenses. Still, China is at least trying to make up for its lack of aerial tactical nous with new anti-air defenses. In November 2022, the People's Liberation Army PLA, unveiled the FK-3000 air defense missile system, along with two others, the HQ-16FE and the Red 11 systems, at Airshow China 2022. It was the FK-3000 that stole the show as it comes equipped with a powerful air defense missile that can deflect most standard ammunition used by fighter planes. Add to that a mini-missile designed to resist cluster bombs and a special transmitter to jam radio signals, and it's a powerful anti-air force. Even better for China, much of the vehicle that holds this weaponry is remote-controlled. That includes its transporter, erector, launcher, and radar Telar, platform, which holds a turret that can be fired remotely to fend off attacks. More support comes from a pair of auxiliary vehicles, again unmanned, that can handle ground combat to defend the main vehicle. The FK-3000 is impressive, but it can't do anything against America's fighters. Instead, it's designed to ward off attack helicopters, cruise missiles, and similar large targets. No stealth detection capabilities means it has its limitations. All of those munitions and equipment could, and likely would, be deployed by the US in a Comeo attack. But the very nature of Comeos means that China's anti-air defenses would be able to do little against anything other than large targets that are somewhat close to the ground. For the many craft that are either out of range or equipped with stealth technology, the FK-3000 would essentially be useless. Again, we see Beijing doing what it's doing with fighters, playing catch-up. Of course, you could argue that the US couldn't launch an aerial attack from home soil to China, the distance is too great to fly from one country to the other essentially protecting each one against the other's aerial forces, right? That's not the case. According to Al Jazeera, the United States maintains 750 bases around the world, with at least 220 of those bases being in Asian countries that could easily put the US into range. Japan is the frontrunner and a vital military partner to the US with 120 bases, South Korea coming in close behind with 73, Australia hosts seven, and will likely build more as its military ties to the US grow, with both Kuwait and Saudi Arabia having 10 US bases. Looking at a map of the world, you'll see why this is such a problem for China. Combined, those bases offer coverage from the east, west, and south. China is essentially surrounded by major countries that hosts US troops and could, in the event of war, become launching points for Comeos and other American aerial operations. In contrast, China only has one official remote military base located in Djibouti, meaning it's still not within range, and certainly not to the extent that America is to Beijing. Granted, China is looking to expand its overseas presence. Stars and Stripes reports that Beijing may look to build new bases in Myanmar, Bangladesh, and Cambodia in the coming years. Plus, its investments in infrastructure projects in many Asian and African countries provide it with some leverage to establish more bases in the future. But to achieve the type of coverage that the US has, China would need to establish a presence in South America and Canada, neither really being options for Beijing. China is trying to catch up once again. It's doing so covertly, especially with its loans for infrastructure projects that could place many smaller countries in its back pocket. But the US is far ahead in that game, because it's established itself in several Asian countries that put it within striking distance of China. Simply put, America can launch attacks on China without Beijing being able to reciprocate, at least without a lot of effort and aircraft carriers, putting China at yet another aerial disadvantage. Still, if China had better pilot training, that would at least be something it could hold against the states. Unfortunately for Beijing, it doesn't. According to Air Education and Training Command AETC, the U.S. Air Force Academy pumps out over 3,400 cadets every year. Those cadets are training in the principles and techniques used to fly advanced planes and helicopters, in addition to receiving ground training, so they're at least somewhat effective if they're grounded. Some cadets also undergo officer development training, which improves their leadership and coordination skills. After completing this primary phase, the cadets are split into three groups with each being an advanced training course focused on a specific type of craft. These groups include one for bombers and fighters, another for helicopter training, and yet another that teaches advanced operation of tankers and airlift planes. A fourth and constantly growing group is also selected to learn how to remotely fly unmanned craft. 
All told, a pilot cadet will get between 180 and 240 hours of flight training before they're deployed in the field, leaving them well equipped to handle almost anything thrown at them. As with everything else, the PLAF lags behind in the training department. Beijing is aware of this too, which is why it's engaging in a concerted campaign to bring more Western influence into its training program. According to Sky News, the PLA started a recruitment drive in late 2022 aimed at attracting British military personnel to help train its pilots. The outlet says that around 30 former British pilots took the payday, with salaries reputed to be around £240,000 or approximately $300,000 per year. However, some are calling the move a breach of security. That makes sense. Not only do these British pilots have more experience than many of China's flyers, but they also understand Western aircraft. Who's to say they won't divulge secrets? This is obviously distressing news for all Western countries, including the US, but it's also an indicator that China is playing catch-up in training just as much as everywhere else. It wants to know how Western powers operate. It needs to find and benefit from experience that its own trainers simply don't have. And as long as it's offering so much money in exchange for that knowledge, it will be able to attract people who can improve its training outcomes. This could be a sign that China is getting desperate. And beyond splashing the cash to attract better trainers, it's also trying to force pilots through their training faster than ever before. In a July 2022 article, Le Monde reported that China had proudly proclaimed that cadets trained in the J-10, one of its multi-role fighters, had completed their training in three years rather than the standard six. That was big news for Beijing. It had only started training pilots using the J-10s in 2010, with such a fast pilot turnaround being put down to an increased ability to conduct tactical training and live four operations. But is that really the case? Or is Beijing making the same mistake that Moscow makes by failing to ensure that its cadets have enough flight hours to be effective once they're engaged in active warfare? What China claims as a victory in training efficiency could simply be a rush job that says something very different. We're scared of the US and we need more pilots now. Beyond that, secrecy surrounds China's Air Force training, as it does with so much of the PLA's operations, with propaganda and the occasional news report being the main sources of what they actually do. Regardless, Beijing recognizes the superiority of Western training. If it didn't, it wouldn't be spending around $9 million per year on former British pilots. But even if the Brits can teach China a thing or two, there's one more reason for Beijing to cower in the face of America's aerial might. Nuclear weapons. The US and China are both capable of launching nukes, with China's growing arsenal being an obvious cause for concern for all Western nations. However, the Center for Arms Control and Non-Proliferation (CAC) points out that it has extremely limited options when it comes to dropping nukes from the air. At best, it may be able to equip a plane with a nuke and hope to achieve a clean drop, but it's more likely that the plane will be shot out of the sky long before it delivered its payload. Beijing is trying to do something about this, the CAC reports that its development of the Zhan H-20 stealth bomber is likely to give it better nuclear capabilities from the skies, especially as its design is purposefully similar to the America's B-2 bomber. But that plane likely won't enter service until 2025 at the earliest, leaving China with no aerial nuclear threat until then. The US has that threat in abundance. Atomic Archive points out that the States has two bombers capable of launching nukes the previously mentioned B-2A Spirit and the B-52H Stratofortress. What's more, it has 850 warheads, though not all being in commission, that it could launch from these planes. That stockpile is larger than the 350 total nukes that China is believed to have, which is already scary for Beijing. The fact that these bombs can be launched from the skies, likely out of the reach of any of China's anti-air defenses, is terrifying. Again, China is playing catch-up by trying to develop a bomber with similar capabilities. But until it has that and can manufacture at pace, the US will always hold the ultimate trump card if it somehow manages to lose in all other aspects on the aerial front. But based on what we've shared here, that isn't likely to happen. The US has more, better trained pilots and far more aircraft than the PLAAF. It has superior tactics because it knows how to use its versatile fleet to conduct coordinated attacks designed to achieve air supremacy rather than simply support ground troops. Plus, thanks to the US having bases established in so many countries that surround China, it's far more capable of launching attacks over Chinese airspace than Beijing is over America's territory. And even if all of that superiority fails to deliver an aerial victory for the US, 
it can always press the big red button and launch nukes from the sky to devastate China. It's no wonder that China is running scared. The only worry for the US Air Force is that China is trying to run toward it rather than away. With all of its investment into military modernization, coupled with Beijing's willingness to spend big to attract pilots, we may see China becoming a stronger aerial force in years to come. But what do you think? Is China right to be terrified of America's aerial capabilities? Or does it have some way to mitigate them that we haven't explored here? As always, tell us what you think in the comments section. Thank you for watching the video, and don't forget to like and subscribe for more military content from military experts. China has been the world's economic miracle story of the last 50 years. Since the People's Republic began to open its economy to the world in 1978, China has gone from an impoverished backwater to one of the centers of the global economic system. GDP growth has averaged 9.32% over the 44 years since it opened up. China has become the world's second largest economy by nominal GDP and has even surpassed the United States when measured in GDP by purchasing power parity. In sure signs of its economic strength, China managed to avoid recession during both the global financial crisis of 2008 and the COVID-19 pandemic of 2020 to 2021. However, since 2010, when it surpassed Japan to become the world's second largest economy, the trend has been clear. China's rate of economic growth is slowing down. The country grew by only 2.99% in 2022, which is low by its standards. What is going on in China's economy and what does it mean for that country and the security of the Indo-Pacific region? Since the internal chaos in China ended with Mao's death, the Chinese Communist Party has maintained power on an implicit promise. It would still rule in an authoritarian manner, but in exchange, the people would get the benefit of security and fast economic growth. So far, the party has managed to fulfill this promise. Made in China has practically become an institution in the global economy. The People's Republic has entrenched itself at the heart of the world's supply chain, and not just in cheap manufactured goods either. China dominates the manufacturing process of many of the world's most important supply chains. For example, it holds a near monopoly position in the rare earth elements that are crucial raw components for the modern digital economy. China controls 50 to 60% of the mining market for these materials and 90% of the intermediate processing stage. China's GDP per capita has risen from $156.4 in 1978 to $12,720 in 2022. However, this period of breakneck unprecedented economic growth came with hidden costs, and those cracks in the foundation are now beginning to show. One of the most important of these problems is China's looming demographic plunge. Long the world's most populous country, China peaked in population in about 2020 and has now begun a slow decline. UN sources estimate that India surpassed it as the world's most highly populated country in April 2023. By the end of the century, demographers predict that China will have about 776 million people, a little over half of what it has today. This is bad enough for the Chinese economy but hidden beneath these raw numbers are trends that are arguably worse. China's working population peaked at about 763.5 million in 2014. In 2022, it had shrunk to 733.5 million. The World Bank warned in 2016 that by 2040, China's working age population could shrink by over 10%. Meanwhile, the elderly are growing as a share of the Chinese population, and it is happening at a rapid rate. In 2015, there were 136.9 million people over the age of 65 in China, which is more than Japan's entire population, and the trend will accelerate. By 2030, China's 65 and over population will be 238.8 million, more than Japan and Egypt's combined total populations. By 2050, China's elderly will be almost 350 million strong, equal to the total combined populations of Japan, Egypt, Australia, and Germany. There is also a comparative lack of younger people in China to support these aging people compared to that seen in other countries. This problem comes as a result of China's one-child policy, which was implemented between 1979 and 2015 as a way to curb the supposed problem of overpopulation. Although the policy was modified to two children in 2015 and all limits on childbirth were removed in 2021, the consequences of this policy will be felt for many years to come. For nearly 40 years, the one-child policy limited the growth of the younger cohorts of China's population. The Chinese government has been trying to encourage women to have more children, 
But in this, it's facing another hurdle the one-child policy created for so long. China has a serious shortage of women of childbearing age. Chinese families have long had cultural preferences for sons over daughters. The inability for families to have more than one child meant that female fetuses were preferentially aborted during the years the one-child policy was in place. Infanticide and abandonment of daughters were also widespread in certain areas. One 2015 study found that in some areas where it was common, as many as 1 in 10 baby girls were abandoned in the 1990s. Lucky abandoned girls were adopted by families abroad. Others faced social disadvantages in their adopted family homes. Unlucky ones did not survive. Another 2015 study estimated that there were 62 million missing women in China, women who would be alive today if not for the one-child policy and the preference for male births. Because of the combination of these cultural practices and the draconian one-child policy, millions of Chinese men cannot find wives. In 2021, there were about 30 million more men than women in China, and the gap is widening. Perhaps unsurprisingly, China's fertility rate has fallen to a historic low of 1.23 births per woman. The easing and eventual overturning of the one-child policy has not been enough to stop this trend. Child rearing is also expensive, as raising one child to the age of 18 costs nearly seven times China's GDP per capita, and China's draconian response to the COVID-19 pandemic ensured that even expecting mothers had limited hospital access, further disincentivizing women from having children. Why are these demographic issues so problematic for China going forward? Because the country has long relied on a young and mobile workforce, productivity will therefore decrease as this cohort become less of a presence in the overall population. The shortage of workers, especially in the country's all-important manufacturing sector, will lead to increased wages and reduced profitability for the companies involved, making China less of an attractive place to invest. As India's population grows and remains younger than China, companies will likely see it as a more attractive place to allocate capital to, as its workforce proportion will increase in population relative to China. Meanwhile, China's response to the COVID-19 pandemic, its draconian zero-COVID policy, with frequent lockdowns that lasted from January 2020 to December 2022, has done more than harm expecting mothers. It's disrupted China's supply chains, further increasing the incentive for foreign investors to park their manufacturing elsewhere. To make matters worse, China's population is aging at an earlier stage of the country's national development than that seen in places like Japan or Europe. China will therefore need to adjust how it cares for its elderly. This is expensive and will require institutional changes, particularly as there are fewer younger working people to care for their elderly relatives, which has been the cultural norm in China up until now. Without institutional support, the growing cost of elder care will even further disincentivize young people from having children, making for an even worse demographic problem in the future. China may need to look at its neighbor Japan for a model on how to take care of an increasingly elderly population. However, China's economy faces shorter-term challenges as well. One of the nagging problems is that its Belt and Road Initiative BRI, which was one of the centerpieces announcing China's arrival as a supposed global financial powerhouse, is rapidly becoming a trillion-dollar disaster. In 2013, China began the BRI as a means to expand its influence. By investing in the infrastructure of so many nations on the Eurasian landmass and the African continent, China could reorient world commerce away from the United States and toward routes that converge on Beijing, routes conveniently harder for the American military to reach. However, these investments have not been able to deliver on the ambitions Beijing had for them. Examples of less-than-optimal results abound, from Kenya's railroad to nowhere, to the financial failure of Sri Lanka's Hambantota port, to the scaling back of the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor CPEC. Originally worth $62 billion, CPEC has been subject to corruption, financial setbacks, and terrorist attacks. The project's crown jewel, the port of Gwadar on the Indian Ocean, did not meet the financial expectations that China or Pakistan believed that improvements to the port would afford it. The lack of performance of CPEC has swelled Pakistan's national debt and forced the country to take a $6.3 billion bailout from the IMF. In fact, China's financial practices for its BRI have set the ambitious scheme up for failure. While infrastructure investments from Western countries typically have low interest rates over 30-year periods, China's BRI can have interest rates as high as 7% for half that time span. China also imposes coercive terms in lending the money, it can call in debts at any time, 
and often prohibits the debtor countries from getting refinancing or being able to restructure their payments. These terms have now had some unexpected consequences for the creditor country. Firstly, the BRI is not meeting its expectations, and the costs involved to the debtor countries have prompted participants to leave. Italy and the Philippines were two of the most important countries to join the BRI, as China's gaining influence within them could have given it some leverage over the US-led alliance system. However, both of them pulled out of the BRI in 2023. As BRI-related projects have often not delivered on their promises, more countries are reassessing or leaving China's infrastructure program. Meanwhile, as the countries that have taken Chinese money often have trouble paying back the funds, those outstanding debts have become a problem for the creditor country. China's BRI began with a lending spree on terms that seemed lopsided in Beijing's favor. Unfortunately for Beijing, when the creditor lends $1 trillion, that creditor is placing itself in a position of vulnerability. By lending so much under such harsh conditions to less than creditworthy customers and projects, China was taking as big of a gamble as the debtor countries. The numbers bear this out. In 2010, only 5% of China's overseas lending portfolio went to parties that were in financial distress. In 2023, that number is 60%. The end result is that Beijing now has a major problem on its hands in getting the money back. China has needed to issue $240 billion in emergency loans to 22 countries. 80% of those loans came between 2016 and 21. However, those bailouts didn't come cheaply. The debtor countries needed to take a 5% interest rate, over twice that charged by the IMF under similar circumstances. This dynamic raises longer-term questions about the sustainability of Chinese BRI debt and whether China will ever get its money back. The BRI is also slowing down, as countries grow more worried about China's international ambitions, especially in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. They have been more concerned about the security risks of the BRI and hesitant to start new projects under its banner. Although secondary to the worries over security risks, environmental concerns have also been increasing in relation to the BRI, causing additional hesitance. China has attempted to address the environmental concerns. In 2019, the leadership in Beijing pledged to reformat the BRI into an open, clean and green project. However, there is little indication that environmental contingencies are taking place in existing BRI projects, and China's response to the COVID-19 pandemic and its wolf warrior diplomacy have further increased skepticism of Beijing's initiative abroad. The United States is also making it more difficult for China to implement the BRI. America's sanctions on Chinese state-owned firms, many of which have been heavily involved in the BRI, increase the hesitance of third-party organizations to work with them. For example, China has already asked for collaborations with third parties in the marketplace to reduce the costs of financing the BRI, attempting to collaborate with France, Italy, and Singapore in the process. However, because of American sanctions on Chinese companies involved in the BRI, these third parties that China is attempting to bring on board are more hesitant to offer assistance, leaving China on the hook and hoping it gets its money back. China's BRI is therefore facing problems which now threaten to undermine the homeland's economy and contribute to China's own considerable financial problems. As China grew so rapidly, it went on a lending spree at home just as much as it did with the BRI abroad. The lending spree is now creating problems in the Chinese domestic economy. One of these is in the growing debt problems faced by municipalities in China. For example, Wuhan, the largest city in central China and the origin of the COVID-19 pandemic, has been forced to call in the loans it extended to hundreds of local entities. According to the city's finance bureau, 259 entities owe it a combined total equivalent to $14 million. These organizations include public and private companies, government departments, and even think tanks. Another consequence of China's zero-COVID policy was to drain the budget of many municipal and provincial governments, adding to the provincial and municipal debt problems. The lockdowns prevented economic activity, while governments were forced to spend large amounts of money on frequent mass testing programs and quarantine centers. To further illustrate the problem, Guangdong province alone spent $22 billion on the zero COVID policy, while revenues declined sharply. Tax breaks to businesses hit hard by China's zero COVID policy have also contributed to declining revenues and reduced local government services. Over $524 billion worth of such tax breaks were granted by government entities across China. In total, China could have outstanding government debt over $18 trillion. 
$10 trillion of which is hidden debt that riskier local government financing agents owe. Some of China's cities have responded by reducing medical spending for the country's growing elderly population, cutting transportation services and lowering fuel subsidies. Chinese municipalities have also been forced to reduce wages paid to government employees. Even wealthier provinces like Guangdong, Zhejiang, and Jiangsu have forced their workforces to take 30% pay cuts. Overall, in the span between 2016 and 2023, China's government debt grew from a 47% ratio of its GDP to 102%. This ratio is still behind the United States at 122% of GDP, but the debt growth rate in China has been far steeper. China's real estate problems are adding to the problems of government debt and economic weakness. Land sales make up about 40% of the revenues for local governments in China. Unfortunately for them, these have been in decline after a long period of expansion. Between January and October 2022, land sales in China fell by 26% from the same span in 2021. China's real estate developers are losing revenue as well due to collapsing home sales. Data released by China's 100 biggest property developers show that new home sales were 33% lower in July 2023 than they were a year earlier. China's largest property developer, Country Garden, abruptly withdrew from an attempt to raise $300 million in new shares on the news of the decline in home sales. In October 2023, international observers believed that Country Garden had defaulted on its foreign debt payments. International bondholders were reported in Reuters as seeking urgent talks with the company. Country Garden's troubles are far from an isolated case. In 2021, China saw a wave of defaults by major property developers. Evergrande, another of China's behemoth real estate developers, was declared to be in default in December of that year, failing to make $82.5 billion worth of interest payments. Evergrande has since gone into bankruptcy. The Evergrande problems accompanied those of Kaiza, another property developer, which had its shares halted on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange after it became unlikely to meet a $400 million offshore debt deadline. China's real estate market was critical to its rise as an economic powerhouse, making up as much as 30% of its GDP. Overexpansion of the property market, however, has long led investors and foreign observers to point out a bubble in the real estate sector. China's ghost cities have become a frequent item of international attention. There may be as many as 50 of these cities at various stages of development. Originally, these were intended to redistribute some economic opportunities and give rural people somewhere else to go than China's huge coastal cities. However, these developments have often not delivered on their promises to investors. There may be as many as 50 million empty apartments in these developments, which have few or no residents in total, which means they are not returning the capital that was spent in creating them. Chinese authorities have tried to shore up the property market and have at times demonstrated the ability to develop cities from scratch. The Pudong district in Shanghai was once a swamp, Today, it has a population of about 5.6 million. The ingredients for success in the top-down developmental approach are availability of jobs and transportation, but it's far from certain if China will be able to translate the success of Pudong to the other ghost cities located further away from China's coastal heartland. China's demographic problems will also present an increasing challenge to the unused property that attracted so much capital during the expansion phase. Less people means less demand for the large amounts of homes and shopping centers that China has accumulated over the years. China's economy has also become less productive because of its increasing politicization, the frequent embedding of Communist Party members in private companies, and the authorities favoring state-owned companies over private ones has made domestic investors nervous and foreign investors even more leery about putting their money into Chinese enterprises. China's ability to keep itself at the center of existing supply chains and entrench itself at the center of future supply chains will be put further into question. China has become a colossus in the global economy, but some of the measures it took over the years to ensure its continued growth increasingly look like they have proven short-sighted. With aversion from international investors, sanctions from the United States, and fewer people to make purchases in real property or in consumer goods, China's economic growth will continue to slow down and with uncertain debt structures both at home and abroad, a Chinese financial crisis seems inevitable. Meanwhile, China's increasing economic weakness could pose even more security challenges in the Indo-Pacific region. China has invested much of its wealth into its military buildup, and with economic troubles growing, Beijing might get the impression that it needs to use its military power 
to remake the order in the region now, when it still has the chance and the inertia from its period of economic growth is still going. This is why many American military leaders and national security experts worry about an invasion of Taiwan before 2030. The situation, with the growing regional power close to peaking in its influence, resembles that seen in Germany before World War I. But do you think the same? What do you think are some of the challenges facing the Chinese economy as we move into the second quarter of the 21st century? Will China's economic problems add to a short-term security challenge for the Indo-Pacific region? Don't forget to let us know in the comments. And make sure to hit the like and subscribe buttons to support the channel and get more military analysis from military experts. The People's Republic of China has big plans. By 2049, it aims to displace the United States as the world's most powerful country, completing its 180-degree turnaround from an impoverished colossus suffering under a supposed century of humiliation. It is a poetic goal, fit for an epic story. There's a fundamental flaw in the story, though, China's own geography, which effectively aids the United States' strategy to contain its ambitions. In this video, we'll explore the containment strategy and China's attempts to get around it. In the Cold War, the United States and its allies faced a big problem, literally. This was the European Plain, which begins at the Bay of Biscay in France and extends for thousands of miles all the way to the Ural Mountains. The further east you go, the broader the plain gets. With the Soviet Union and its Warsaw Pact allies extending from the Urals all the way to central Germany, the United States and NATOs were outnumbered and forced onto a narrow front. There, the Communist powers could concentrate all of their forces in an offensive drive to the west. For Washington, this geostrategic disadvantage meant that the only seemingly feasible means of containing communism in Europe was through nuclear deterrence. It was not the case in Asia. When the Chinese Communist Party took power in 1949, the United States came up with its island chain strategy to keep the People's Republic and its Soviet ally bottled up in the Eurasian landmass. The strategy, formalized in 1951, was largely the brainchild of John Foster Dulles, then an advisor to President Truman and later Secretary of State under President Eisenhower. Originally, the island chain strategy comprised three strings, essentially three lines of defense against communism in the Pacific. These lines remain in place today. The first island chain stretches from the Japanese archipelago down to Taiwan, through the Philippines, and finally into the Indonesian archipelago, stopping at the Strait of Malacca. The second island chain also starts from Japan, where it moves through its Bonin Islands, past the Japanese-governed volcano islands in Micronesia, past the Mariana Islands like Guam, through the western Caroline Islands like Yap and Palau, and ends in western New Guinea. Finally, in the classical strategy, there was the third island chain. This line starts at the Aleutian Islands in Alaska, and stretches through the vast center of the Pacific Ocean, through Hawaii, American Samoa, Fiji, and ends in New Zealand. In more recent times, as China's power has grown and as Beijing has displayed its ambitions for the Indian Ocean and Africa, some American national security experts have added fourth and fifth island chains to their planning. The fourth island chain moves southward from Pakistan through the Las Kadweep Islands and the Maldives westward of the Sri Lankan port of Hambantota which is controlled by China through its Belt and Road Initiative BRI, and the important US-UK military base of Diego Garcia. The fifth island chain, meanwhile, starts with the United States' Camp Lemonnier base in Djibouti on the Gulf of Aden and hugs the African coastline. Although the fourth and fifth island chains have not been formally codified into American national security strategy, most experts have informally accepted them as being part of the United States' overall plan of containment. The first island chain was and remains the most important part of Washington's containment strategy. It's the shortest, easiest to defend, and encompasses a significant portion of the world's population and economic activity, making it clearly more important than the other island chains. For China to become anything more than a regional land power, it must first break the containment of the first island chain. Unfortunately for Beijing, this presents numerous challenges. China is a nation that heavily depends on food and energy imports, much of which goes through the South China Sea's shipping lanes, which are contained within the first island chain. China's economy also depends on its exports, which also go through these maritime trade routes. Any disruption to these trade routes in either form would prove devastating for the Chinese economy, which is already slowing down after decades of breakneck growth. 
To make matters worse for Beijing, the first island chain presents a series of natural choke points that the United States and its allies could use to cut that shipping off. These include the Straits of Malacca, Luzon, and Miyako. For China, being able to get around these choke points is an item of top priority. It has approached the problem from two directions. First, it's invested a large portion of the wealth of its economic rise into a hefty military buildup, especially its naval and air forces. China now has the world's largest navy by sheer number of vessels, although not by tonnage, and this marks a key disadvantage. Despite its numbers, China's People's Liberation Army Navy PLAN, is still not capable of surviving a direct confrontation with the United States Navy. However, Beijing understands its military disadvantage and has adapted to the situation with a strategy of anti-access area denial A2AD. This strategy is meant to make it too costly for the United States to project power into the first island chain, should conflict break out. In the event of a confrontation, China has an arsenal of thousands of ballistic and cruise missiles ready to destroy American ships and bases in the region. As part of this strategy, China has built and militarized artificial islands in the disputed waters of the South China Sea. Some of these, such as Mischief Reef, host ship-killing missiles and runways for fighter jets and bombers. If China cannot yet kick the United States out of the first island chain, it's raised the cost of projecting power into the area significantly and might reasonably hope to make sustained forward presence there politically untenable in the war-weary American homeland. This is the tyranny of distance. The United States is adapting to China's A2AD strategy, though, which makes it imperfect for Beijing's ambitions. In early 2021, the United States made plans to establish a string of precision strike missiles along the First Island chain as part of a $27.4 billion military package centering on the Indo-Pacific theater over the following six years. The Precision Strike Missile is a land-based ballistic missile with a range between 60 and 500 kilometers, which can be launched from mobile rocket artillery platforms like HIMARS, making this weapon durable and harder for China to remove from the board with missile attacks. The Precision Strike Missile is the coming replacement for ATACMS and has recently entered service in a limited capacity. The US Army announced it had received its first batch of these missiles on December 8, 2023. Stationing these weapons along the First Island chain is, for Washington, a vital part of re-establishing a conventional deterrence that it acknowledges has eroded in recent years. Another of the most important adaptations for Washington to defend the First Island chain is through the presence of new bases in the Philippines, which began in 2014 with the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement EDCA, and has expanded in 2023. Presumably, some of the precision strike missiles slated for delivery to the theater will be placed in these bases. China had once hoped to court the Philippines into its orbit, despite the dispute in the South China Sea under the friendly Rodrigo Duterte presidency. As part of this effort, China was supposed to invest $24 billion in BRI-related projects. Securing investment and strategic infrastructure in the Philippines would have been very valuable to Beijing, as it would have helped to break China's containment in the first island chain. However, the BRI investments never truly panned out, and Duterte's successor, Ferdinand Marcos Jr., withdrew from the project in late 2023. The end result? The United States has increased its presence in the Philippines, while China remains shut out. The crown jewel in China's ambition to break out of the First Island chain is a conquest of Taiwan, which the People's Republic has always considered a rogue province left over from the Civil War and century of humiliation. As Taiwan sits at the center of the First Island chain, its importance was recognized as soon as the Chinese Communist Party came to power. As early as the 1950s, the United States committed to keeping the Communists out of Taiwan. When the mainland bombed the outlying Kinmen and Matsu Islands where Taiwanese troops were stationed and set off the first Taiwan Strait crisis, the United States Congress and the Eisenhower administration made it clear that they would use military force to destroy a Chinese invasion. Dulles even publicly threatened a nuclear attack on the Chinese mainland if the communists attempted to take the island. China had no choice but to back down, a dynamic that has repeated since then. China's more recent military buildup has increased the importance of Taiwan. For the first time, American national security officials are not entirely confident that the United States military can successfully defend the island, at least not without tremendous cost that the American public might be reluctant to bear. However, the United States continues to arm Taiwan through the 1979 Taiwan Relations Act. With this help,
Taiwan has adopted what it calls a porcupine strategy, which aims to make the cost of an invasion as bloody as possible for Beijing. In a series of war games from January 2023, the Center for Strategic and International Studies found that out of 24 scenarios, China succeeded in an invasion twice, but it only did so when the United States did not intervene or when Japan did not allow it to use the bases in its territory. Even when China did succeed in conquering the island, it came at a cost of 70,000 casualties and 23,000 deaths. In a more realistic scenario, the costs would be far greater. Again, bad news for Beijing. The present situation suggests that for China, attempting to break out of the first island chain by military means is still too difficult or costly. However, many experts are still worried. If China were to break the containment of the first island chain, the line would become longer and much more difficult to defend, even if it's closer to the American homeland. For example, the United States Air Force would have a harder time projecting power as refueling operations would need to move north to keep tankers out of range of China's fighters. The United States Navy would lose command of the first island chain's choke points and would be more vulnerable to a Chinese missile threat that would extend hundreds of miles further east. For these reasons, the United States has invested more heavily in the second island chain in recent years to shore up the region's defenses. This comes in response to China's moves. For example, China has tried to expand its BRI into Micronesia. This is part of its strategy toward deeper political and economic integration in pursuit of its ultimate goal, which is to build bases in the second island chain that will allow it to project military power there. However, China's efforts in the area have met controversy. Two months before leaving office in May 2023, former Micronesian president David Penuelo claimed that China had tried to threaten, bribe, and otherwise pressure his country's officials to go along with its strategic goals. So far, though, China has had no luck in building a base in the second island chain. Unfortunately for Beijing, the United States also has deep ties to the region. It already has unlimited military access rights to Micronesia and the Marshall Islands. These rights are part of a pact between Washington and the Freely Associated States FAS, of Micronesia, the Marshall Islands, and Palau. This military access is expanding its infrastructure too, to make it more robust. In the summer of 2021, the United States and Micronesia agreed to build a new base there to allow a more permanent American military presence. So far, because of its territory in the area and the deep ties between Washington and the FAS, the United States has largely kept China at bay in the Second Island chain, and it's being assisted by Japan, Australia, New Zealand, and Taiwan in doing so. All of these countries understand that allowing China to build a presence in the Second Island chain would make them more vulnerable. China has had more success in the Third Island chain. The Third Island chain is important because it sits on the lines of travel and commerce between the United States and Australia. In World War II, the Japanese Empire attempted to disrupt this line. In the 21st century, China has increased its investments in the area, potentially hoping to do the same thing the Japanese tried to do. As part of this effort, China has increased its ties with the Solomon Islands and Kiribati. In the Solomons, China has taken advantage of increasing estrangement between that country and Australia. When the anti-Australia Manasseh Sogovar returned to power as Prime Minister in 2019, Beijing seized on the opportunity. The Solomons withdrew its recognition of Taiwan that year and signed a memorandum of understanding that permits China to deploy its police forces to deal with internal unrest. The MOU also allows for some Chinese military presence. Although it does not permit the creation of a base, it allows for some rotational basing of Chinese military personnel. The expansion of China's security presence in the Solomon Islands is a direct threat to Australia, and it worries that country and its allies. Kiribati has also seen an increased Chinese presence. It too ended its recognition of Taiwan in favor of the mainland in 2019. In 2021, it signed on to a Chinese loan to lengthen an airstrip on the island of Canton. If this project is completed, China will have its easternmost facility. Although this will not be a full-blown air force base, it would give China an increased ability to conduct surveillance on the United States in the Third Island chain. Despite its success in the Third Island chain, however, Beijing has also encountered problems. The United States and Australia retain a big presence in the region. Tuvalu rejected China's attempts at influence. Meanwhile, China greatly desired to increase its presence in Papua New Guinea, which sits just north of Australia. China had hoped to incorporate Papua New Guinea into its infrastructure financing and renovate a port there that could be turned into an ideal base for the PLAN. 
Instead, Papua New Guinea offered the facility to the United States and Australia in a joint arrangement. This base sits just outside the reach of China's missiles. Overall, despite its recent successes there, the balance of power in the Third Island chain still favors the United States. The Fourth Island chain is a relatively new concept in American national security circles, but China's interest in the Indian Ocean has brought it to prominence. With China relatively contained within the first three island chains in the Western Pacific, it sought alternatives to access the world's waterways. While the waters off the Chinese mainland are surrounded by hostile islands, the Indian Ocean is a much more open place. China has partially succeeded in establishing footholds along the Fourth Island chain. Investments in Pakistan have been one of the cornerstones of China's BRI. These investments, called the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor CPEC, center on the port of Gwadar, which gives China direct access to the Indian Ocean. China has increased this access further with its BRI investments in Sri Lanka, which has included a Chinese takeover of the Hambantota port with a lease of 99 years. China gained control of this port after the initial investment in the infrastructure proved unprofitable and the Sri Lankans were unable to pay the debt they had accrued. This BRI-related infrastructure is important and could signal Beijing's military intentions in the Fourth Island chain. For example, in August 2022, a Chinese ship arrived in Hambantota. Beijing called this a survey ship. However, the ship had also been used for military purposes, tracking satellites and missiles. Western and Indian national security experts were alarmed at its appearance. Chinese officials in the area gave it a warm welcome, while senior Sri Lankan officials were not present at the ceremony. The arrival of this ship was seen as a litmus test of how far China plans to militarize the BRI investments in these areas. However, China's strategy in the Fourth Island chain has faced some problems as well. BRI projects in Pakistan have faced financial difficulties and even terrorist attacks, which have forced them to scale back. The investment in Sri Lanka is more successful from a strategic, if not an economic, perspective. There's a big obstacle in the Fourth Island chain even if the BRI-related projects pan out and China can find a way to militarize the area, the Diego Garcia Naval Base to the south. The Diego Garcia base allows the United States Navy and Air Force to rapidly project power into some of the most strategic areas in the world, like the Persian Gulf and the South China Sea. The advantage Diego Garcia gives the United States was punctuated in the summer of 2020, when three nuclear-capable B-2 stealth bombers arrived at the base. Diego Garcia is in fact only one of a select few bases equipped to handle the B-2, which requires careful climate-controlled hangars known as B-2 shelter systems. That such infrastructure will be built there signals how important this base is to Washington. Despite international controversy that China has understandably helped to fuel, it has no intentions of abandoning the base anytime soon. For China, having the infrastructure and the concentrated force required to overcome the United States military presence at Diego Garcia is a difficult challenge. Thus far, the United States maintains superiority in the Fourth Island chain and can disrupt China's strategy there. Finally, there is the Fifth Island chain. This one is unique as it features China's only actual overseas military base, the People's Liberation Army Support Base in Djibouti, which opened in 2017. The base is close to the United States Camp Le Monnier in the same country. Camp Le Monnier is closer to the coast than China's base is, however, which allows the United States greater leeway in projecting power into the Gulf of Aden and the Indian Ocean. As of now, the fourth and especially fifth island chains are secondary theaters in the great power competition between the United States and China. However, they are an area of burgeoning importance. The moves China makes with its BRI investments in places like Sri Lanka will dictate how they evolve. Unsurprisingly, with all of these maritime disadvantages, China has had to find other ways to try and bypass its containment within the successive island chains. This is why the BRI has prioritized overland infrastructure investments and other beneficial arrangements across the Eurasian landmass spanning from China to Europe. For example, China has increasingly imported Russian energy through overland pipelines since the war in Ukraine began, protecting its energy supply from the US Navy's patrolling in the first island chain. However, with the difficulties that the BRI has faced, this has not proven to be a substitute for the true power projection that the successive island chains prevent China from achieving. Becoming a world superpower often requires favorable geography. The United States had such a geographical advantage from its inception. With weak neighbors and two vast oceans separating it from peer competitors, it avoided damage and disruption, 
and no one was in position to bottle up its trade or naval buildup. Geography has not been so kind to China. Surrounded as it is by hostile powers, China must come up with alternatives to project its power, but so far these have not proven satisfactory. Beijing may have plans to be the world superpower by 2049, but it would hardly be the first time that an authoritarian power could not deliver on its boasts. If China does not find a way around this problem, Xi Jinping's China dream will never come true. But what do you think? Will China be able to effectively break its containment within the island chains? Don't forget to let us know in the comments. Also make sure to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel for more military analysis from military experts. China has taken a bold step to protect its interests and gain more influence. It has built massive artificial islands, equipped with military installations and defense capabilities. But as the world looked on, China didn't see the big problem coming that would mess up its plan for more power. Here's what happened. China aims to be the world's leading superpower by the year 2049, the centennial of the Chinese Communist Party's victory over the nationalists in the civil war and rise to power on the mainland. Unfortunately for Beijing, China's own geography works against it in achieving this goal. China is surrounded by hostile islands that prevent it from projecting power into the world's oceans and threaten to cut off the shipping its economy relies on. To help mitigate this geographical disadvantage, China has attempted to increase its power in the strategically vital South China Sea, seizing control of disputed islands, rocks and reefs. China has since fortified these areas by creating artificial islands and militarizing them with airfields and hangars, radar stations, anti-aircraft weapons, and ship-killing hardware. The United States and China's neighbors in the region watched this island-building campaign with great alarm, marveling at how quickly China built and militarized its islands. However, these artificial islands aren't all they're cracked up to be. In trying to solve one problem, China only created another. Let's just say that these islands might not have the staying power that China needs them to have if it wants to use them as an effective method of power projection in the first island chain. Let's explore the reasons why China built the islands to begin with, why these islands are now in trouble, and why Beijing's ambitions in the South China Sea might sink, literally. The legal origin of the artificial islands comes from China's infamous nine Dash line map which it has used to claim 90% of the waters in the South China Sea. Officially, China justifies this claim and the Nine Dash Line with historical anecdotes. For example, China maintains that it and its people had been in the South China Sea since the days of the mythical Xia dynasty that supposedly began in about the year 2070 BC. Naturally, few people believe these assertions. The historical claims were fig leaves to hide a more cynical, self-interested motive. The South China Sea's waters are economically and geostrategically vital. Economically, the South China Sea has about 15% of the world's total fishing potential, 11 billion barrels of oil, and 190 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. In 2021, 22% of the world's global trade, valued at about $5.3 trillion, passed through the shipping lanes in this area, including 60% of all maritime trade. 40% of the world's petroleum products, and one-third of the world's total shipping. Simply put, whoever controls these waters controls the fates of the countries that rely on this trade. China is one such country. By building its artificial islands and fortifying the area, China can more easily protect its own trade, muscle in on the natural resources in the South China Sea, and exclude the access of other nations, or at least charge them expensive tolls for the use of such resources. Geostrategically, however, the South China Sea is still trapped within the first island chain. To make matters worse for Beijing, these island nations are aligned with China's strategic rival, the United States. Because of the geopolitical alignment, the United States Navy can easily blockade a series of choke points around the South China Sea and disrupt or cut off shipping to the Chinese mainland. The most important of these choke points is the Strait of Malacca, through which China gets a large portion of its energy. In 2016, 16 million barrels of oil and 3.2 million barrels of liquefied natural gas pass through these narrow waters every day, a figure that is likely now higher. China's dependency on the trade that passes through this choke point has been called its Malacca Dilemma, and Beijing has often used this supposed vulnerability as an excuse for its territorial expansion in the area. By building and militarizing islands, 
China can theoretically bring more ships, aircraft, and missiles closer to the Strait of Malacca and other hotspots, giving it more leverage over the choke points and making it more costly for the United States Navy to project power into the First Island chain. To make a long story short, China wants to seize control of the rocks and reefs in the South China Sea to promote its own self-interest at the expense of other nations like the Philippines, Malaysia, and Vietnam, on whose exclusive economic zones Beijing has encroached. A 2016 ruling against Beijing by the Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague, which completely invalidated the Nine Dash Line as a legitimate territorial claim, was simply ignored. As is often the case in international relations, the strong do what they can, and the weak suffer what they must. China had expanded its reach into the South China Sea through military means since the 1970s, when it seized control of the Paracel Islands from Vietnam. However, China began its modern campaign in the South China Sea when it seized control of the Scarborough Shoal from the Philippines in 2012. The following year, China started to expand much further. It began building artificial islands in the Spratlys, creating 3,200 new acres of land, militarizing the islands as the years went by. In total, China has 28 outposts in the waters of its supposed Nine Dash line map. 20 of these outposts are in the Paracel Islands, an additional seven are in the Spratlys, and it also has the Scarborough Shoal. The artificial island building campaign centered mostly on the Spratlys. Artificial islands are created by dredging and shifting material from the reefs and seafloor beneath them. Rocks and sand must be pulverized in this process and, naturally, the creation of artificial islands was destructive to the wildlife in the area. Mounds of material needed to be pulverized and moved in the process. The American Admiral Harry Harris, who was commander of the United States Pacific Fleet at the time these constructions were taking place, called these artificial islands China's Great Wall of Sand, in a speech delivered to the Australian Strategic Policy Institute in March 2015. According to an analysis by the Centre for Strategic and International Studies, China has reclaimed a total of 13.5 square kilometres of land across the seven reefs it has used in its island-building campaign. China's island-building vessels can dredge up material at impressive rates. Just one of them, the Tianjing Hao, operated by CCCC Tianjing Dredging, can deploy a cutter with the power of 4,200 kilowatts to the seabed. Material is then moved through a pipeline ashore for land reclamation purposes or onto a barge. The Tianjing Hao can deploy its cutter to a depth of 30 meters and extract 4,500 cubic meters of material per hour. Between February and March 2014, this ship was spotted conducting dredging operations in Johnson Reef in the Spratly Islands. This area has now been occupied by China and the reef has since been militarized. Although Johnson Reef is too small to host aircraft, it is armed with anti-aircraft guns and radar systems, contributing to a potential Chinese defense in depth of the area should hostilities break out in the region. CSIS considers Johnson Reef to have been a test run for more sophisticated military structures at more famous and well-armed places like Fiery Cross Reef, Mischief Reef, and Subi Reef. The Tianjing Hao was far from the only such ship in China's dredging operations, which can only be described as having been a success. To counter China's Great Wall of Sand island-building campaign, the United States Navy has conducted Freedom of Navigation Operations FONOPS, since 2015. These operations see the close transit of U.S. Navy ships and aircraft around the artificial islands in an attempt to ensure that the South China Sea's shipping lanes stay open. These FONOPs have done little to alter the situation in the South China Sea, however, and numerous close calls between the American and Chinese militaries in the area have led some in Washington to call for them to end. On the flip side, other national security strategists believe that ending the FONOPs and essentially ceding the military prerogative in the area to China would only allow Beijing to entrench itself in the region that much further. Without the United States Navy maintaining a presence in the area, they fear that China's People's Liberation Army Navy would be completely unfettered in asserting its will over the shipping lanes and other countries in the area. Fortunately for the United States and China's weaker regional neighbors, the US Navy might no longer need to do the heavy work alone. Nature itself is assisting in the effort to prevent Chinese hegemony in the South China Sea because the artificial islands are starting to erode and sink. As early as 2019, it became apparent that China's islands were not as stable as Beijing was hoping for. In the first place, China has extended its reputation for often shoddy construction methods to the new islands. 
The Economist reported that the concrete China used in building the island bases could not cope with the elemental settings in the area. This concrete was instead turning to sponge in such conditions. Additionally, there is vast corruption within China's construction industry. This corruption has extended to China's military ambitions before. For example, in 2019, Su Bo, the overseer of construction for China's Liaoning aircraft carrier, was convicted on corruption charges and sentenced to 12 years in prison. Corruption in the construction industry has often led to substandard work, and the same appears to be the case on many of the artificial islands in the South China Sea. As is often the case, China appears to have cut corners in its construction methods. The concrete which displayed problems was not laid properly on all of the islands. For best results, metal rods should have first been driven into the seabed and then a concrete retaining wall built around the island. This was not always the case, and the structural integrity of some of the islands has begun to erode because of this lack of precaution. For China, speed and cheapness was the priority in these island-building campaigns, which explains why they were built so rapidly. Perhaps international observers should have been a little less alarmed. Much like China's belt and road infrastructure projects and domestic building efforts, quality control was not at the top of the list of priorities in the islands. It also does not help that China has little experience with building structures that would be designed to survive in the type of elements seen in the South China Sea. Beijing made the matter worse and exacerbated its disadvantage by refusing to call in foreign experts for assistance during the island building campaign. The result is that the islands and the infrastructure that make up the bases on top of them were not constructed with top-of-the-line materials. In fact, the islands at Subi Reef, Mischief Reef and Fiery Cross Reef in the Spratlys were so unstable that fighter jets from the People's Liberation Army Air Force PLAAF, had not landed on the airfields there by 2020. This is unlike Woody Island in the Paracels, which China has militarized with a runway capable of supporting the landing of heavy bombers a feat it had demonstrated in 2018. The lack of use of the runways in the Spratly bases begs the question of why China would choose to build such long structures if they were not going to be used for aircraft. Experts concede that the decision not to land military aircraft there may be seen as a gesture of goodwill to reduce tensions in the region. However, given China's brazen and belligerent stance, this is unlikely. By far the likelier explanation is that the islands are in some way an illusion and cannot support such operations. The weather and climate will also be problems for China going forward. A hit from a powerful typhoon could prove far more devastating to the Chinese constructions than their shoddy concrete. As ocean water warms with a warming global climate, these super typhoons will probably occur in the South China Sea more frequently. China appears to have made no plans for this contingency, however. One super typhoon in the South China Sea hitting in the wrong place might undo all the years of effort Beijing put into its island-building campaign. A warming climate causes other difficulties for China's artificial islands. These islands were not built with any seawalls or other protective infrastructure to preserve them against rising waters. However, as the climate warms, glaciers in the Arctic and Antarctic melt and add to rising seas. Since 1992, global sea levels have risen by almost 4 inches and continue to rise at a rate of about 0.15 inches per year. NASA predicts that by 2050, sea levels along the American coastline could be 10 to 12 inches higher than they are today, and the more global temperatures warm, the faster the glaciers will melt and the more rapidly the ocean will rise. For example, the ocean rose twice as fast between 2013 and 2022 than it had between 1993 and 2002. Although it's uncertain how far sea levels will rise by the end of the century, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change estimates that in the best-case scenario, sea levels will rise between 11 and 21.5 inches from now to then. In worst-case scenarios, where competition between states and resurgent nationalism takes priority over environmental concerns, sea levels could rise as high as 40 inches. These sea level rises do not necessarily mean that all coastal communities as they currently exist will need to evacuate. Many communities have seawalls and other defenses, However, China's artificial islands are built at sea level and have no such defenses against erosion and rising waters. China meant the islands to be a string of permanent fortifications in the South China Sea, but it did not build them in a way that would be fit for this purpose. The problem of sea level rise gets worse when one considers that China destroyed vast swathes of coral reef and mangroves in the construction efforts. These structures form a natural barrier against the elements. 
This is because they break waves and dissipate their energy. Coral reefs allow for sediment to establish itself on the shallow and flat portions of the reef, where mangroves can establish themselves. Once there, the mangroves further break apart the energy of waves and storm surges since the roots and trunks of the trees absorb some of the water. When taken together, these coral reefs and mangroves provide a first line of defense against things like sea level rise and storm surges from typhoons. However, China destroyed these same ecosystems when it began constructing its artificial islands. In an ironic twist that some observers might call a case of poetic justice, China wiped out the very defenses that their islands would have needed to have more staying power in the wake of a warming climate, rising sea levels, and more frequent and powerful typhoons. In 2019, China claimed that it would begin work to restore the coral reefs in the Spratly Islands. China's Ministry of Natural Resources said that facilities to protect and recover these reefs had been installed on Fiery Cross, Subi, and Mischief Reefs. It also said it would survey more areas to identify where coral reefs had been damaged or destroyed and adopt a combination of natural and artificial methods to help the reefs recover themselves. However, China does not exactly have a good track record in this area because in 2015, its State Oceanic Administration claimed that construction of the artificial islands did not alter the health of the Spratly Islands ecosystem. These statements came at the same time that ships like the Tianying Hao were dredging and pulverizing the coral reefs. China also claimed that overfishing and natural causes had damaged the reef long before construction began. With such history, it's little wonder why few trusted China's word in 2019. And about five years later, there is still little evidence that China has meaningfully worked to restore the coral reefs in the Spratly Islands. Perhaps as sea levels rise and the risk of severe typhoons increase, Beijing will have no choice but to try to make good on its word out of calculations of self-interest. It has invested significant national prestige into its artificial island building campaign and created much bitterness around the world as the price for it. If these islands were to fail in their purpose, Beijing will have wasted a large amount of resources for little gain. However, there is another danger that comes with investing so much to try to shore the artificial islands up. Such investment in some ways defeats the very reason to build fortifications in the first place. The purpose of fortification is not to be an impregnable defense, but to make it more costly for an enemy to project power and to free resources for the builder of the fortification to project power in other theaters. By leaving comparatively few soldiers or weapon systems in a fortification, these assets of military power can be deployed elsewhere where they can be put to better use. However, at the rate the islands are deteriorating and threatened by weather and climate, China might need to continually concentrate resources on saving this Great Wall of Sand, rather than using it as an effective method of statecraft. The fortifications that were supposed to be an aid to Chinese power projection might increasingly become a drain on it, as they become more expensive to maintain in terms of money and labor hours spent on them. In some ways, the problems facing the artificial islands in the South China Sea were predictable as they follow a historical pattern concerning China. China is and always has been a colossus of a nation. However, it also has a history of not being able to live up to its full potential. For example, it was the wealthiest country in the world even into the 19th century. But despite this, it was unable to effectively use this advantage to compete with the Western powers and Japan. Now, history might be repeating itself. China is again a wealthy and powerful nation, but it is increasingly plagued with problems that might not permit it to achieve the full potential of its recovered status on the world stage. The expansion in the South China Sea has mirrored this age-old conundrum for Beijing. At first, it appeared the island-building campaign would solidify its place on the road to hegemony in the area. But through alienation of its neighbors, poor planning, and shoddy construction, these edifices might be the latest example of history repeating itself, with China not being able to take advantage of its latent potential. The islands were supposed to be a signal to the world that China was back, rejuvenated, as Xi Jinping might say. But if they sink, it will be a signal of another sort. There is no doubt that the artificial islands succeeded in accomplishing China's short-term goals for the South China Sea. However, the game of nations is always a marathon and not a sprint. If the islands cannot stay for the long haul, they will cost China far more than they have gained for it. But what do you think about China's artificial islands in the South China Sea? Do you think they will have the staying power and can be an effective method of power projection for China in the future? Don't forget to let us know in the comments, and also make sure to hit the like button and subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. The US would come to Taiwan's aid if China attacked. 
That's the most common scenario for the war game simulation. For the last decades, China has been rising and making it clear that Taiwan should undoubtedly be its territory. At the same time, it is seductive to ask, could the US conquer China on its own? More and more governments are looking to war as an effective way to resolve long-standing conflicts, and tensions between the US and China are rising from time to time. Let's start with analyzing the nuclear arsenal. In accordance with the March 2023 New START declaration, the United States possesses 1,419 strategic nuclear warheads that are distributed across 662 strategic delivery systems, including intercontinental ballistic missiles, submarine-launched ballistic missiles, and heavy bombers. In accordance with the New START Treaty, the United States and the Russian Federation are required to conduct semi-annual exchanges of information regarding treaty-accountable items. Additionally, the United States maintains an approximate inventory of 100 B-61 nuclear gravity bombs, which are forward deployed at six NATO bases located in five European countries. These bases include Aviano and Gedi in Italy, Buchel in Germany, Incirlik in Turkey, Kleiner Brogel in Belgium, and Volkel in the Netherlands. On October 5, 2021, the US State Department released a declassification announcement revealing that the total count of both active and inactive US warheads stood at 3,750 as of September 2020. It's worth noting that these figures exclude retired warheads and those awaiting dismantlement. According to the Federation of American Scientists FAS, the current military stockpile is estimated to consist of 3,708 warheads with an additional 1,536 retired warheads awaiting dismantlement. Consequently, the total number of warheads as of early 2023 is estimated to be 5,244. Big number, right? Actually, this figure signifies a huge decrease in the stockpile compared to its peak of 31,255 at the conclusion of the 1967 fiscal year. What about the Chinese nuclear arsenal? Managing the count of nuclear warheads in China poses greater challenges. Over the past few decades, China has consistently modernized its nuclear capabilities, with a significant expansion in both the number and variety of weapons deployed in recent years. As of November 2022, the Defense Department's assessment suggests that China might possess as many as 1,000 deployable nuclear warheads by the year 2030. According to independent researchers, China could now have approximately 410 operational warheads ready for deployment across 218 strategic delivery systems, including intercontinental ballistic missiles, submarine-launched ballistic missiles, and nuclear-capable bombers. China is currently in the process of constructing a new generation of submarines equipped for carrying nuclear warheads, with the utilization of Russian technology playing a significant role in their development. The incorporation of Russian technology is expected to enhance the submarine's stealth capabilities, making them considerably more challenging to detect and track. A study conducted by the China Institute of Maritime Studies at the U.S. Naval War College has underscored the potentially profound implications of these upgraded Chinese submarines for the United States and its allies in the Indian Ocean. Analysts and defense experts suggest that the creation of these advanced Type 096 nuclear submarines may be finalized by the end of this decade. Christopher Carlson, a naval intelligence analyst, has described the new 096 submarines as a nightmare due to their anticipated extreme difficulty in detection. So what would a nuclear war between these two countries look like? Forecasting the scenarios of a nuclear war between the US and China shows that in the absence of the decisive influence of other factors, there would be no winners in such a battle. The exchange of even a dozen nuclear strikes would have a huge impact on international security and the ecology of the affected territories. Hundreds of thousands of people would die. The fact that nuclear weapons are used would lead to increased escalation and retaliation, and the spiral of violence and death will only grow. The use of hundreds of warheads would cause the destruction of the foundations of the existence of the modern world, its economy and nature. If the US and China decide to use all their nuclear warheads, the result would be sub-zero temperatures within a few years, and most of the planet's population would die of starvation or disease. That is why most experts avoid the prospect of using nuclear weapons during such a conflict. At the same time, there are opinions that China may be able to use it if it feels it poses a significant threat to its own security. During war, the leaders do not always think rationally. In general, the USA has the second largest nuclear arsenal in the world and China has the third. 
but the usage would be a loss for both sides. Okay, the mutual destruction by nuclear weapons is obvious, but who is stronger in other types of armed forces? Let's begin with the Air Force. The modern air power of the United States Armed Forces stands unrivaled, boasting a formidable fleet of over 13,000 aircraft across various categories, with over 5,000 of those just in the Air Force. China can only dream about such a number. This comprehensive inventory encompasses combat and direct attack aircraft, alongside a substantial complement of transport planes, aerial refuelers, specialized mission platforms, and training aircraft, including both fixed-wing and rotary-wing models. Through ongoing modernization efforts, select Cold War-era aircraft have been effectively adapted for contemporary battlefield demands. Additionally, the US Air Force has made significant strides in its commitment to next-generation platforms like the F-22 and the F-35. The US Air Force remains unique in its possession of a dedicated bomber fleet capable of conducting conventional and nuclear missions. Furthermore, its special mission force excels in various specialized airborne operations, offering invaluable support to Allied aircraft and ground commanders. The US Navy maintains an expansive carrier force, enabling it to project power and engage adversaries worldwide effectively. Yes, US troops are everywhere in the world. The US Marine Corps boasts an impressive array of aircraft, rivaling and often surpassing the capabilities of top-tier international air services. US Army aviation is anchored by a vast rotorcraft fleet, featuring the AH-64 Apache attack helicopter and the UH-60 Black Hawk as prominent examples. A breakdown of the US Air Force's composition reveals that nearly 25% are combat direct attack aircraft, close to 40% are rotorcraft helicopters, 7.4% constitute the transport fleet, 18.4% are dedicated to training, and 9.4% serve in special missions and other roles. The most popular models are Boeing AH-64 Apaches 808, Lockheed F-16 Fighting Falcons 775, Sikorsky SH-60 Seahawks 508, Northrop T-38 Talon 497, Raytheon T-6 Texan IIs 445, Boeing CH-47 Chinook 394, Boeing KC-135 Stratotanker 388, Airbus UH-72 Lakota 367, Lockheed F-35 Lightning II 310. Discussing the future strategy of the United States Air Force is a crucial and high-stakes topic. The 2022 National Defense Strategy underscores the importance of deterrence through denial, urging the Department of Defense to explore asymmetric approaches and enhance its posture of denial to discourage potential aggression, particularly in scenarios where adversaries might attempt swift territorial acquisition. The debate at hand within the broader discussion centers on how to implement this approach, with two prevailing schools of thought. The first school of thought emphasizes the significance of air superiority and the capability to overcome China's air force as vital elements in achieving effective deterrence. The second line of thought advocates a defensive strategy. Let's take a look at the Chinese Air Force next and see how they compare to the US. Upon closer examination, Chinese air power reveals a predominant reliance on a copy-and-paste approach for many of its frontline combat assets. Comprising a total of 3,044 units, or only a little over half of the US Air Force's 5,000 aircraft. These Chinese entries predominantly originate from Soviet, Russian, French, Israeli, or American sources, with few genuinely domestically developed products to highlight. Although their overall quality and battlefield effectiveness remain largely unproven, the Chinese military can boast significant quantities to deploy in the event of a full-scale conflict. The foundation of modern Chinese air power is primarily attributed to contributions from the former Soviet Union modern Russia, and more recently, France. A breakdown of the Chinese Air Force's composition reveals that 47.5% are combat direct attack aircraft, almost 40% are rotorcraft helicopters, 8.8% constitute the transport fleet, 12.3% are dedicated to training, and 3.4% serve in special missions and other roles. The most popular models are Chengdu J7 Fishcan 387, Shenyang J11 Flanker L 315, Mil High 17 Hip 242, Chengdu J10 Firebird 235, Harbin Z9 175, Hongdu JL8 170, Zhan H6 120, Chang Z10 106. As you can see, it's not so impressive compared to the US. Does this mean the US would ultimately beat China in an aerial battle? 
In the event of a conflict, the foremost objective of the US Air Force would be to wrest air superiority from China. Simultaneously, it is essential to weaken Chinese forces by employing precision strikes from a considerable distance. When the pivotal moment arises, the Air Force can execute a sudden, forceful shift to offensive air superiority, akin to wielding a swift and decisive retribution. To attain air superiority, American forces will need to target China's robust integrated air defense systems, including critical assets within the mainland such as air bases, radar installations, air defense assets, and potentially command and control centers. Conversely, China's primary aim is to maintain control over its airspace. Their strategy centers on denying access to their airspace to limit the US's capacity to achieve and utilize air superiority for offensive military operations. This approach allows for resource preservation by employing a substantial quantity of smaller, cost-effective weapons distributed across various locations. The defender of airspace aims to endure the initial air and missile strikes from the adversary and subsequently contest control over the airspace. Conversely, the attacker seeking air superiority against modern air defense systems must overcome multiple layers of defense across various ranges and altitudes. The advantage clearly lies with the defending side. Attempting to breach heavily fortified Chinese airspace would likely result in significant losses. If a US endeavor to secure air superiority and swiftly defeat Chinese invasion forces proves unsuccessful, it could lead to a catastrophic defeat that jeopardizes the Air Force's ability to sustain a defensive war of attrition. These factors collectively erode deterrence. China deploys a mix of Russian-manufactured and domestically produced air defense systems, with the capability to track and engage enemy aircraft. The technological sophistication of these weapons, coupled with their potential for upgrades, presents significant challenges for the United States in its quest for air superiority in a large-scale engagement. China's air defense arsenal includes the formidable Russian-built S-300 and S-400 surface-to-air missile systems, renowned for their effectiveness worldwide. These systems can undergo upgrades to enhance their capabilities further. The latest iterations of the S-400 and upcoming Russian S-500 missiles are interconnected thanks to high-speed computer processing that enables precise, long-range threat detection. These systems offer extended range and heightened sensitivity compared to their predecessors. However, it's important to note that the ability to detect the presence of an aircraft in the sky doesn't guarantee continuous tracking or successful engagement of the aircraft. China's air defense threat extends beyond Russia's built systems, as the People's Liberation Army Air Force complements them with domestically developed systems. China operates its indigenous HQ-9 surface-to-air missiles and is actively working on the HQ-19 missile systems, designed to counter ballistic missile warheads. As a result, any potential aerial assault over mainland China would likely require aircraft to operate at higher altitudes to avoid detection by air defense. Alternatively, unmanned systems could be employed for target reconnaissance, or long-range ballistic and cruise missiles fired from land or sea platforms could be utilized to neutralize Chinese air defenses from safer standoff distances, minimizing the exposure of manned aircraft to enemy fire. So the US is unlikely to be able to achieve control over the air by conventional means due to China's advanced air defense system. It would just be too expensive. The losses would be huge, and it's not a fact that the USA would be ready to take them. Upon scrutinizing the Russian-Ukraine conflict, military experts from various nations recognize the escalating significance of drones in future warfare. The United States is progressively incorporating more drones into its strategic planning, the objective is to compel China to expend costly missiles to eliminate a plethora of inexpensive and readily available UAVs. Drones are poised to enhance reconnaissance capabilities, neutralize air defense systems, target naval vessels, and deplete enemy resources more effectively. Concurrently, China is actively advancing its drone programs and scaling up production efforts. In alignment with this trend, a new strategy within the US Air Force proposes a pivotal role for drones, operating in coordination with fighter aircraft. The US Space Force envisions drones not as independent combat units but as integral components of the Air Force's Collaborative Combat Aircraft Initiative. In this concept, a manned fighter is accompanied by an AI-equipped and armed drone, designed to be cost-effective and capable of autonomous and paired operations. The outcome of a potential drone confrontation between the United States and China remains uncertain.
but these unmanned systems possess the potential to yield significant advantages and disadvantages for both sides. And what about the trial weapon, Army Ground Forces? US Ground Forces are undergoing a comprehensive modernization effort to align with the demands of contemporary warfare, moving away from Cold War-era doctrines toward a more agile and mobile fighting force. The US Army's composition comprises 416,504 units, categorized into various types, 361,127 utility and engineering vehicles, 44,124 infantry fighting vehicles, 4,657 combat tanks, 3,000 air defense units, 2,322 artillery SP, and 1,267 artillery towed. At the forefront of advancing ground forces is the M1 Abrams main battle tank, MBT, renowned as one of the heaviest modern tanks. Weighing between 57 and 61 tons, the Abrams is equipped with multi-layer composite armor, which incorporates depleted uranium for its high-density properties and operates on gas turbine engines running on jet fuel. Because of this, of course, the speed of the vehicle suffers, a little more than 41 miles per hour. This American tank has been in service with the US Army since 1980. The latest iteration, the M1A2 SEP variant, features advanced computerization, thermal imaging, and GPS systems for remote weapon control. The Abrams tank has played pivotal roles in conflicts such as Operation Desert Storm, Enduring Freedom, and Iraqi Freedom. Multiple Abrams tank modifications exist to meet diverse operational needs. Additionally, the M2 Bradley Infantry Fighting Vehicle IFV, is a staple in the US military's inventory. This American-tracked IFV, produced by BAE Systems Land and Armaments, features a conventional IFV layout, with the engine transmission compartment at the front and the infantry compartment in the rear hull. Its crew comprises a commander, gunner, and mechanic driver, and the BMP is capable of carrying up to seven paratroopers. The M2 Bradley boasts an aluminium body and laminated armor, providing protection against 0.57-inch caliber bullets. It is armed with a 0.98-inch M242 automatic cannon and two BGM-71 TAU launchers, which demonstrated its prowess in countering Soviet tanks during the Persian Gulf War. An essential addition to the US military is the Striker, which has expanded its presence due to its versatility across a range of battlefield roles. General Dynamics Land Systems manufactures the Striker Armored Combat Vehicle, which has been in service since 2002, with 350 horsepower the Striker achieves a range of 329 miles and a speed of 38.5 miles an hour. It can accommodate two crew members and nine passengers, with the driver being able to switch between 8x4 on-road and 8x8 off-road modes. Various weapon systems can be mounted on the Striker, such as the 12.7 M2 Browning machine gun or the Mark 19 grenade launcher. Moreover, the Striker is equipped with a V-shaped bottom and Mexus modular composite armor capable of withstanding 12.7 caliber bullets. The US military is also incorporating an expanding fleet of wheeled vehicles, drawing from experiences in urban warfare in Afghanistan and Iraq. As we can see, the US has significant forces. But what about China? In the historical context, the Chinese land forces have traditionally relied on the Soviet Union and later Russia as their primary sources for military hardware, with recent diversification including Western support, notably from France. An increasingly noteworthy trend is the development of indigenous Chinese solutions to meet local requirements across a spectrum of categories, including main battle tanks, armored fighting vehicles, artillery systems, multiple rocket launchers, and security vehicles. In total, the Chinese land forces maintain and operate a substantial fleet of nearly 200,000 armored and unarmored vehicles, alongside a considerable artillery force. Solidifying their position among the world's top four land forces, this inventory encompasses 121,300 utility and engineering vehicles, 17,020 armored fighting vehicles, 5,015 combat tanks, and 4,591 artillery pieces. The Type 96, initially designed as the Type 88C, represents a key component of the People's Liberation Army's tank forces and was a main battle tank introduced into service in 1997. Its development commenced shortly after the conclusion of the Gulf War in 1991. The Type 96 marked a milestone as the first Chinese tank equipped with a 4.92 inches smoothbore gun and automatic loader. The tank features a forced liquid-cooled diesel engine generating 1,000 horsepower facilitating a maximum speed of 40 miles per hour 
Its main gun is an unlicensed copy of the Russian 2A46M, boasting a barrel length of 48 calibers. The ammunition capacity stands at 42 rounds, with 22 of these stored in an automatic loader mechanism akin to the T-72 design. The PLA ground force is extensively mechanized, equipped with a variety of armored platforms, advanced electronic warfare capabilities, concentrated firepower, and modern weapon systems that hold their own against their Western counterparts. But machines of war are nothing without people. So let's talk about the manpower of armies next. The United States has a population of 337,341,954, with a manpower pool of 148,430,460 individuals. The total number of military personnel is 1,832,000 comprising 1,390,000 in active military service and 442,000 in reserve. The US military enforces a stringent selection process for candidates. Despite its rigor, it serves as the largest employer, providing soldiers with competitive salaries and comprehensive benefits. Eligible Americans can begin their military service at the age of 17, with an age limit of 42. Upon successful testing and evaluation, candidates sign contracts ranging from two to six years. Strict physical fitness requirements, assessed through the Army Physical Fitness Test APFT, are pivotal during the candidate selection process. This test includes 35 push-ups, 50 abdominal exercises in two minutes, and a two-mile cross-country run within 16.5 minutes. This test is mandatory not only for recruits but also for active military personnel, who must take the APFT every two years. The standards may slightly vary with age, and individuals in excellent physical condition are subject to specific criteria, which are outlined in a separate document. For instance, a man with a height of 5.58 feet should not exceed a maximum weight of 180 pounds, and for women of the same height the limit is 161 pounds. Moreover, all candidates must undergo a mandatory background check to ensure a clean legal history, maintain a strong credit record, and have no visible tattoos. China, with its vast population of 1 billion people, boasts one of the world's largest standing armies, totaling around 3.1 million personnel across standard service branches – Army, Navy, and Air Force. This includes over 2 million active personnel, constituting over 60% of the available manpower. In the event of conflict, China's substantial population provides a deep pool of potential recruits, enabling a strategy of attrition warfare through sheer numerical strength. The Chinese military utilizes a range of small arms such as pistols, submachine guns, rifles, sniper rifles, machine guns, and mortars, in addition to portable battlefield solutions, including anti-aircraft and anti-tank missile systems. The People's Liberation Army sets specific requirements for aspiring recruits. Chinese military leaders emphasize the importance of maintaining an image of the most experienced and disciplined armed forces. Obese military personnel may face limitations on career progression, motivating constant physical improvement. The Chinese military promotes physical fitness through numerous competitions among its ranks. An intriguing restriction introduced in 2006 bans individuals who snore consistently from joining China's military academies as it's believed that such snoring can disrupt the daily activities of other cadets and hinder their military training. Clearly, these vast armies are not simply transported and deployed on land without careful planning. Aviation and the Navy play a crucial role in facilitating the arrival and landing of tens of thousands of troops and equipment. Therefore, let's examine the critical component for such operations, the naval fleets. The US Navy's carrier fleet sets it apart significantly from its regional rivals. At the forefront are 10 nuclear-powered carriers from the Nimitz class, which, while rooted in Cold War concepts and technologies, have led the service to invest heavily in the new Gerald R. Ford class, promising to enhance US naval capabilities. Currently, only one of these supercarriers is in active service. Additionally, the carrier force is supplemented by straight-deck amphibious assault ships, primarily designed for rotorcraft operations, but also capable of supporting fixed-wing strike aircraft like the AV-8B and advanced F-35 VTOL aircraft. The attack submarine fleet consists of all nuclear submarines, including remnants of the Cold War era like the Los Angeles, Ohio, and Seawolf classes, as well as the more modern Virginia-class boats, which are gradually replacing the older Los Angeles vessels. The guided missile cruiser fleet, also a product of the Cold War period, is slated for reinvestment with the introduction of a modern frigate design, 
as the current destroyer-heavy fleet lacks such vessels. The US Navy maintains a functional mine and countermine force, patrol vessels, and the historic three-masted USS Constitution, the oldest active ship afloat. The Navy also operates various support ships that streamline a wide range of naval operations. So how does China fare in this category? The People's Liberation Army Navy PLAN, has made significant advancements over the past few decades, enhancing its surface and undersea vessel capabilities and bolstering support ships. Now it's as close to US capabilities as ever before. An essential component of its power projection strategy, both regionally and globally, is the growing strength of its fixed-wing carrier fleet, currently consisting of two carriers. This force will soon be augmented by two indigenous designs, offering improved capabilities for blue water environments. The submarine fleet, which includes over 70 boats from multiple classes, still has some life left in it, with only a few beginning to show signs of aging. The destroyer fleet is relatively young, with some of the oldest units not yet reaching 30 years in service. Similarly, the frigate fleet is youthful, with a few exceptions, and currently includes only 40 vessels. The PLAN places a particular emphasis on its corvette strength, boasting around 70 modern vessels in this category. The mine countermine fleet consisting of eight units is relatively old, with the youngest being 27. The offshore strength hulls are also approaching a critical stage in their service lives, with the 10 vessels being over 25 years old. The amphibious assault force has seen a revival with the introduction of modern players designed for helicopters and transport operations from ship to shore. Additionally, 24 vessels are on order, strengthening the fleet in the carrier, submarine, destroyer, and landing helicopter dock categories. Overall, the PLAN has made significant progress in enhancing its naval capabilities. Its ultimate goal is to one day challenge the United States as the world's preeminent naval power. So which navy would win? At present, the United States regards the Chinese Navy as a formidable force, capable of contesting American naval dominance in the Western Pacific Ocean during a military conflict. This marks the primary strategic challenge for the US military since the end of the Cold War. It's worth noting that this is a pivotal moment in the contemporary era of global geopolitical competition. Throughout history, naval arms races and fleet rivalries have consistently foreshadowed shifts in global leadership. The competition between the United States and China in military capabilities, particularly with their respective navies, is just one facet of the broader strategic rivalry encompassing political, diplomatic, economic, technological, and ideological dimensions. The US sees the Chinese Navy as a critical component of China's efforts to challenge the United States, the primary military power in the Pacific. Over the past 25 years, China has been actively modernizing and expanding its naval capabilities. U.S. observers have expressed concerns and, in some cases, raised alarms about the pace of growth and development in Chinese naval shipbuilding. They scrutinize the evolving capabilities of the Chinese Navy in comparison to the U.S. Navy and conclude that the United States is gradually losing its edge. China's naval modernization encompasses a broad spectrum of initiatives, including the introduction of new ships, aircraft and weapons, enhancement in maintenance and logistics, the development of naval doctrine, improvements in fleet personnel quality, education and training of naval personnel, and extensive exercises. American experts have identified certain areas of weakness within the Chinese Navy, including limited compatibility with other branches of the PLA forces, anti-submarine defense capabilities, long-range maritime operations, limited supply capabilities at sea, a restricted number of overseas bases, and challenges in training a substantial number of new sailors for the crews of the new ships particularly in the absence of relative combat experience. Chinese naval personnel are aware of these limitations and actively strive to address them. The Chinese Navy has substantial reserves beyond its primary structure, with the Chinese Coast Guard being the largest in East Asia. This force functions as the rear or coastal component of the Navy, and under a centralized mobilization system, integrates a significant number of civilian fishing vessels. In assessing the two competing navies, it's important to consider the difference in ship types. The US Navy has a greater number of heavy ships, including aircraft carriers, guided missile cruisers, and destroyers, while the Chinese Navy possesses more light ships, such as frigates and corvettes armed with guided missiles. Additionally, US surface warships are equipped with an extensive 9,000 vertical launch missile launchers, whereas the Chinese Navy has approximately 1,000. American warships are technologically advanced. All US aircraft carriers are nuclear-powered, 
while the first three Chinese aircraft carriers utilize conventional propulsion. All American submarines are nuclear-powered, while most Chinese submarines use diesel propulsion. The majority of Chinese submarines are best suited for coastal operations rather than extended ocean voyages. Anti-ship ballistic missiles are a key asset in China's naval capabilities in a potential conflict with the US. The Chinese missile forces are armed with two types of medium-range anti-ship ballistic missiles, the DF-21D, with a range exceeding 932 miles, and the DF-26, with a maximum range of approximately 2,485 miles. Both systems are deployed on specialized mobile launchers. Moving on, which one of these countries has the upper hand when it comes to strategic positioning? In a hypothetical scenario where the United States attempts to conquer China independently, geographical factors come to the forefront as crucial determinants of the conflict's outcome. The longer the duration of the war, the more apparent China's geographical advantages become. China's vast land border, spanning 13,954 miles with neighboring countries, poses a significant challenge to potential U.S. efforts to enforce an economic maritime blockade. This extensive border nullifies attempts to cut off maritime access effectively. Furthermore, China boasts the world's longest navigable waterways, totaling 68,350 miles. These waterways provide rapid mobility for various goods and military forces, when conventional transportation infrastructure, such as roads and railways, fall short. In times of war, they serve as crucial routes for the movement of personnel, equipment, and supplies to critical areas. Conversely, the United States faces a considerable geographical distance from China. It's like half of the world. That would stretch its supply chains significantly, seriously impacting the dynamics of the conflict. Nonetheless, one favorable factor for a potential invasion is China's lengthy coastline extending over 9,000 miles. A lengthy coastline necessitates a substantial commitment to homeland defense, as it provides open access to deep water sources. Many nations have, therefore, developed specialized coastal patrol craft and amphibious assault forces to mitigate concentrated sea-based attacks. A lengthy coastline requires dedicated defenses, which could potentially offer the US an advantage in terms of operational flexibility. Additionally, the concentration of most of China's human and material resources near the coastline could be advantageous for the US during the initial phases of an invasion. Thus, at the beginning of the war, the geography of China will be its disadvantage, which will eventually become a tangible advantage in the event of protracted attempts to conquer it. To comprehensively analyze this scenario, it's essential to delve deeper into the economic aspects as well. The United States, once the world's largest trading nation and a primary bilateral creditor, has seen a shift in global dynamics. Presently, nearly 100 nations consider China their foremost trading partner, while the United States maintains such a relationship with only 57 countries. China's influence has grown over the past decade, marked by a substantial commitment of $1 trillion to infrastructure projects through its Belt and Road Initiative. Whereas US aid contributions have diminished, the United States wields remarkable financial clout through its extensive transnational financial institutions and the global prominence of the US dollar. The majority of foreign exchange reserves are held in dollars, with only a small portion denominated in yuan. The US remains a front-runner in the development of pivotal technologies, including bio, nano, and information technologies, that will be pivotal in this century's economic growth, although China has been making substantial efforts to establish formidable competition. Furthermore, the United States enjoys an advantageous position in terms of energy resources. Over the past decade, the shale revolution has transformed China into a net energy exporter, while China's reliance on energy imports has increased. Maintaining access to global resources during a conflict would be a significant advantage for the US, while China may require time to diversify its supply sources. Nevertheless, relying excessively on allies during a prolonged war could be a risky proposition. The cost of materials in the US National Defense Reserve has significantly decreased since 1952 by over 95%. In contrast, China's strategic reserves hold a considerably larger quantity of critical mineral resources. For example, China's strategic stockpiles contain approximately 7,000 metric tons of cobalt, whereas the US National Defense Reserves holds just over 300 metric tons, down significantly from more than 24,000 in 1990. This may lead to an underestimation of the critical mineral reserves required for stockpiling considering the potential duration of a US-China conflict. 
In the context of a short and intense war, the emphasis would likely be on replenishing ammunition, as constructing and deploying new platforms would be impractical before hostilities began. The ability to replenish resources, as demonstrated in the Russian-Ukraine conflict, holds substantial importance in such scenarios. One significant resource deficiency in China pertains to semiconductors, as the majority of these critical components are either imported or manufactured by foreign suppliers. Semiconductors, often referred to as the oil of the 21st century, serve as the foundational technology in a wide range of devices, including smartphones, satellites, and anti-missile defense systems. The intricate process of advanced chip manufacturing is among the most complex in the manufacturing industry, involving over a thousand production stages and lasting three to four months. That's a long time for a war between such influential states. For Chinese economists, achieving semiconductor self-sufficiency is of paramount importance. China has established substantial investments in the semiconductor industry. However, it lags behind Taiwan by approximately a decade in several crucial areas. China's overarching goal is to establish what is known as a closed loop, where domestic companies would oversee every aspect of the sector, including raw materials, engineering, chip design, manufacturing, and assembly. Conversely, the United States maintains dominance in the semiconductor sector, primarily due to its leadership in research, development, and design. How clever they are! The US has largely outsourced the production of advanced chips, primarily to Taiwan. Over time, the US share of global semiconductor production has decreased significantly, from 37% in 1990 to approximately 12%. In the event of a conflict between the United States and China, Taiwan's specialization in chip manufacturing would exacerbate global challenges. If China refrains from attacking Taiwan, the United States would have a significant advantage by maintaining Taiwan as a crucial ally. If China attacks, it will be another impetus to the world financial crisis that will arise due to the war. It's also important to understand that the US and China are each other's largest trading partners. A war between them would have a huge impact on the economies of both countries and the world. Now it's time to analyze the last important factor in the war – potential allies. Here's another consideration to keep in mind when contemplating a conflict. Who are your allies? Given the current global landscape, the United States faces a challenge in concentrating all its efforts solely on China. Various hotspots around the world and unresolved conflicts necessitate US presence and influence. Resources are also allocated to support the defense capabilities of countries such as Ukraine, NATO member states, Israel, Japan, Taiwan, and others. However, it remains uncertain whether these nations would be inclined to directly engage in a conflict with China and provide military support unless they were directly threatened. Can the US really trust their allies? In contrast, China holds an advantage over its potential adversaries. As many of the US's opponents possess substantial military forces, weaponry, and access to natural resources, a protracted conflict could unpredictably escalate tensions worldwide draining the resources of the United States and its allies, and potentially expanding into a broader and more extensive conflict. Economically, the US's allies wield significant influence, but the global financial crisis that could arise in the wake of a conflict's onset makes it challenging to predict the extent of their support. An intriguing question pertains to whether the United States has allies within China, individuals or groups dissatisfied with China's policies, such as the Uyghurs. The strength of the Chinese system during times of war, the potential for elite collusion, and the possibility of capitulation all remain uncertain. It's also difficult to anticipate the feasibility and consequences of political assassinations of leaders in both the USA and China, and how such events would alter the course of the conflict. Conversely, democratic institutions in the United States have consistently demonstrated resilience. Simultaneously, strong pacifist and isolationist movements within the US can exert pressure on the government to seek an earlier end to the conflict. Therefore, predicting the domestic and global reactions to this conflict is difficult. If, in our theoretical case, the USA would like to conquer China, then time will not play in their favor. So, can the US conquer China on its own? The answer is probably not. Despite the superiority of many types of modern weapons, the USA will not be able to do this on its own. Even in an alliance with other NATO countries, this will be difficult because of the advantages that a defending country receives and the huge resources China has to do so. Do you think this might change in the future? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts. Here's a nerve-wracking question for you. Why has China been strengthening its military? 
marked as the fastest military expansion since World War II and a campaign of non-military attacks suggest that China is already at war with the US. Or are the reasons for this more complex than meets the eye? In 1996, Taiwan held its first direct presidential election and transitioned to a fully-fledged democracy. This election set off the third Taiwan Strait crisis, with mainland China firing missiles across the water. In response, the United States sent two carrier battle groups to the area, with the USS Nimitz and her colleagues passing through the strait. Beijing had no choice but to back down in the face of this pressure. The incident, which came at the height of the American unipolar moment, is almost entirely forgotten in the United States today, but Beijing always remembered. To the Chinese leadership, the crisis and its conclusion recalled the century of humiliation, the period between 1839 and 1949 where China repeatedly found itself invaded, dictated to, and partitioned by the Western powers and Japan. China vowed to never be at such a disadvantage again. 28 years later, with Taiwan having held another presidential election in January, the situation is vastly different. In this video, we will dive into the details of China's military buildup and how it's changed the balance of power in the Indo-Pacific region. In December 2001, China joined the World Trade Organization. This event was arguably more important to global politics than even the September 11th attacks, as China's entry into the WTO allowed it to entrench itself at the center of many of the world's most critical supply chains and become the world's largest trading and manufacturing nation. Beijing took advantage of the vast wealth accruing to its coffers to spend much more money on its military. Between 2000 and 2016, China's military budget increased at a 10% annual rate. Since then, the rate has slowed, but the military budget has still gone up by 5 to 7% per year. In 1995, at the beginning of the third Taiwan Strait crisis, China wasn't even in the top 10 of worldwide military spenders. Even Taiwan spent more. By 2002, the first year after joining the WTO, China spent about $30 billion on its military, 10 times less than the United States, and was still behind the United Kingdom and Japan. 18 years later, China spent about $260 billion on its military, reducing the gap to about three times less than the United States. However, China's budget actually understates the amount that goes into its military, and China might be spending about $60 billion more per year on its armed forces than advertised. While the spending in absolute dollars still suggests the United States has a big advantage in the military balance of power, fundamentals beneath the hood suggest that China is eroding America's traditional dominance in ways disproportionate to the total spending. The United States armed forces are stretched around the world in global commitments. Meanwhile, China can concentrate all of its military spending in the decisive Indo-Pacific region this is not the only advantage China has. In 2022, Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Acquisition Major General Cameron Holt warned that China was acquiring weaponry at a rate five to six times faster than the United States. He further warned, in purchasing power parity, they spend about $1 to our $20 to get the same capability. We are going to lose if we can't figure out how to drop the cost and increase the speed in our defense supply chains. China's military buildup accelerated when Xi Jinping took power in 2012. Xi has an unusual personal interest in military affairs, at least in comparison with his predecessors, Hu Jintao and Zhang Zemin. Unlike them, Xi holds the title of Commander-in-Chief of the Joint Operations Command Center, while China's People's Liberation Army has always been responsible to the Communist Party and its leader. The new title gives Xi Jinping command at the operational and field level that his predecessors didn't have. Xi also has strong personal and familial ties with the PLA that his predecessors lacked. His father, Xi Zhongzhong, was a military leader in World War II and the Civil War. Even Xi's wife, Pen Li Yuan, was a civilian member of the PLA with the rank equivalent to Major General. Many of those closest to him are also military men with deep ties to the institution. How has China built up its military? First, it has rapidly expanded its People's Liberation Army Navy in both numbers and capability. This was an innovation. China has traditionally been a land rather than a sea power, but its containment in the first island chain and its dependence on commercial shipping necessitated a change. With the first island chain full of American allies and choke points, vulnerable to being blocked by the United States Navy, 
The leadership in Beijing determined that it must have a stronger navy of its own. As late as 2010, China had no aircraft carriers. However, China had in 1998 purchased the sister ship of Russia's Admiral Kuznetsov carrier, and after a long odyssey, finally commissioned the ship as the Liaoning in 2012. In 2019, China launched the Shandong, its first domestically produced carrier based on the Liaoning. However, these two carriers use ski jumps called the Stobar system to launch their planes. This is slower than America's Nimitz and Ford-class carriers, which use a catapult system. Not wanting to be outdone, China launched the Fujian in 2022. This is China's first wholly domestically designed aircraft carrier, and like its American counterparts, it uses a catapult system. Tellingly, the Fujian was named after the province located across the strait from Taiwan. China has no plans to stop with the Fujian. It's currently building at least one more aircraft carrier, codenamed the Type 004. This carrier, which looks very similar to the US Navy's Gerald R. Ford, will be the first in China's fleet to operate on nuclear power, which will give it the ability to stay at sea for much longer durations than its predecessors and at much further ranges. Nuclear-powered ships also have an advantage in generating electricity needed to power advanced weapons and equipment. Some American national security experts believe that China could have five aircraft carriers by 2031, with the newer ones having nuclear propulsion to give them longer ranges and staying power at sea. China also now has the world's largest navy, with 426 hulls in its fleet as of November 2023. However, many of these vessels are not fit for frontline combat, as they are lighter and less well-armed, this is why despite China's fleet units, it still lags behind the United States Navy in terms of combined tonnage, with the US Navy being about twice as heavy. However, a decade ago, the US Navy had a 3 to 1 advantage over the PLAN in tonnage, which shows you how serious China is about closing the gap. The gap is closed partially because China is also building cruisers and destroyers at pace. By 2031, China could have 60 of these, with modern capabilities on similar par with the US Navy's equivalent ships. China is also modernizing its submarine force. This is the area of underwater warfare where China lags the furthest behind the United States. It has 72 submarines in its fleet, but only 15 are nuclear-powered, with six being ballistic missile submarines and an additional nine being conventional attack submarines. The others are diesel-electric submarines, which have less range, cannot dive as deep, and are noisier since they can only run on electric power for a short time. However, China is investing more heavily in its submarine fleet and plans to build two new types of submarines, the Type 095 nuclear-powered cruise missile submarine and the Type 096 ballistic missile submarine. In contrast to the Type 094, the Type 095 and 096 in particular are expected to be much quieter thanks in part to sound isolation technology from Russia. This includes a raft attached to a rubber support system that reduces noise coming from the engine. There is still debate about the origin of this technology being outfitted to the much larger submarines under construction. However, these new underwater craft should at least be comparable to Russia's nuclear Akula-class submarines, the upgraded versions of which are already difficult to detect, according to Christopher Carlson of the US Naval War College. The PLAN is also gaining more experience on long overseas deployments. In 2008, Chinese naval flotillas were sent to the Gulf of Aden to conduct counter-piracy operations, a feat which has recurred over the years. After these missions, which tended to last for three months, the PLAN would sail to other theaters on much longer navigational missions before returning home. The PLAN has also seen frequent operations in the South China Sea, giving it more experience in waters further afield from the Chinese mainland. China's naval buildup is only part of its military modernization program. China has also taken pains to upgrade its air force. As late as the 2000s, China's People's Liberation Army Air Force relied on obsolete second-generation jet fighters like the Shenyang J-6. In addition to obsolete hardware, the PLAAF suffered severely during the Cultural Revolution, which closed many of its technical and maintenance training facilities, leaving it short of trained personnel especially those who could keep the planes fit for flight. It took decades for China to recover from this disaster. However, the PLAAF has changed drastically since the start of the 2010s. Obsolete second- and third-generation fighters have been retired. In their place, three planes have taken the lead role in the PLAAF's fleet. These are the fourth-generation Chengdu J-10C, fourth-generation Shenyang J-16, 
and the fifth generation Chengdu J-20. Between these three planes, China has 600 advanced aircraft in service, with plans to expand. Between 2020 and 2023, production rates of the J-16 and J-20 doubled. At current production rates, China could field as many as 1,000 J-20 planes by 2030. The J-20 has gotten some improvements as well. In 2022, China began upgrading the plane's engine to the WS-15. Previously, the J-20's engine was the Russian AL-31 that had been developed for the Su-34. As the fighters get outfitted with the new engine, the J-20 should be able to fly at supersonic speed without using its afterburners supercruise capacity. All three of these planes have AESA radars and can be equipped with the PL-15 air-to-air missile, which has a range of up to 300 kilometers. The J-20 in particular may also be getting drone wingmen. Although the details are sparse and must be treated with skepticism, these drones could allow the manned fighter to focus on specialized tasks like command and control. The drone, which would also be stealthy, could fire eight intelligent air-to-air -air missiles or loitering munitions drones which linger over the battle space before attacking a target. The concept was revealed at the 2023 Zhuhai Air Show. Interestingly, the former obsolete fighters that the PLAAF was so well known for may be turned into drones themselves. Obsolete planes like the J-6 have been spotted by satellite imagery on military tarmacs despite their being retired. These drones would be easy to spot by radar if they were ever put into combat, but that is part of the point. In a scenario involving Taiwan, for example, these drones could act as a diversion that forces planes to scramble and ignore other areas more important for China's purposes, or they could simply be expendable tools designed to deplete ammunition. The concept has precedent. Starting in 2013, the USAF converted some obsolete F-16s into remotely controlled drones, the QF-16. Although this was done purely to turn them into aerial targets, China might see greater potential for this concept. China has also begun building a new type of air refueling tanker plane, the Y-20U, which made its maiden flight in 2018. The aircraft has three refueling points. The domestic engine to power this plane, the WS-20, is expected to enter production in 2024. China has also modernized its missile forces in arguably the most successful and strategically significant part of its buildup. As early as the late 90s, the Pentagon was worried about the buildup of China's air and missile forces which it demonstrated early in the Third Taiwan Strait Crisis. Reports in 1997 suggested that for Beijing, strengthening the accuracy of its ballistic and cruise missiles was a high priority and that within a decade, China could have as many as 1,000 new projectiles. Washington's expansion of its missile defense networks in Asia further convinced Beijing of the need for a stronger missile force. The May 1997 Quadrennial Defense Review cautioned that while the United States would face no peer competitor in the immediate future, by 2015, there would be the possibility of the emergence of a regional great power or global peer competitor. China now has more than 1,000 ballistic and cruise missiles. The closer one gets to the Chinese mainland, the more missiles there are to hit you. By 2021, China had between 750 and 1,500 short-range ballistic missiles, with ranges of up to 1,000 kilometers putting Taiwan and every American base in Japan, South Korea, and the northern Philippines at risk. There were between 150 and 450 medium-range missiles with ranges of 3,000 kilometers and 80 to 160 intermediate-range missiles with ranges of up to 5,500 kilometers. These missiles put American bases further afield, like the southern Philippines and Guam, the largest in the region, at risk. China also has an unknown number of cruise missiles that pose additional danger to American bases and ships in the region. Hypersonic missiles have been another item of importance for the Chinese military. American officials have conceded that China currently leads in the hypersonic race. In 2018, Mike Griffin, then Under Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, claimed that China had conducted more hypersonic weapons tests than the United States over the preceding decade by a factor of 20 times. China deployed one such weapon into service, the DF-17, in 2019. The DF-17 is a road-mobile, medium-range ballistic missile outfitted with a hypersonic glide vehicle. China further showed its missile capability in the summer of 2021, when it tested a hypersonic device that flew around the world before hitting its target. This weapon was a combination of a fractional orbital bombardment system, FOBS, with an HGV. 
This was only the most spectacular of China's many missile tests in recent years. In 2022, China conducted more ballistic missile tests than every other country in the world combined. China has also begun to expand its nuclear program. Between 2020 and 2022, it doubled its nuclear arsenal from about 200 to 400 warheads. At current production rates, China could have as many as 1,500 warheads by 2035. The new missiles and nuclear warheads, as well as the Type 096 ballistic missile submarine, which would be able to launch projectiles from Chinese waters with a 9,000-kilometer range, demonstrate China's much-improved nuclear capability. In the past, China maintained a program of limited nuclear deterrence. That's now beginning to change, showing Beijing's anticipation of strategic competition with Washington. However, any kind of military equipment, no matter how technologically advanced, is useless without the proper people operating it. That's why China is focusing its military buildup on personnel as much as it is on weapons or technology. In anticipation of a high-tech military, Beijing has launched a recruitment drive seeking to bring the country's best and brightest. Military recruiters have stepped up their presence in China's schools in a bid to bring bright young graduates into service. Military recruiters have especially been keen on enlisting STEM majors in the country's university. The PLA wants 70% of its new recruits to hold at least a university undergraduate degree. As part of its recruitment goals, China increased military salaries by 40% in January 2023. The PLA also offers job security, and Chinese enterprises, especially state-owned ones, tend to give preferential treatment in hiring to discharge soldiers over those with no military experience. Veterans of the PLA will also be allowed to return to combat positions upon re-enlistment. While the recruiting drive seems to be working at keeping the active PLA personnel at a steady 2 million, the world's largest standing army, it's not all smooth sailing. According to China's own polling, only 35% of soldiers who completed their service in the PLA wanted to stay there instead of being discharged to the reserves. College graduates stayed at even lower rates, so while China has made progress in improving the quality of recruits to its military, it will need to take further steps to make it more attractive to the country's most talented minds for the long haul. Like in many other sectors, China also has corruption in its military ranks. As we've seen with Russia's experience in Ukraine, corruption within a military, especially in its logistics, can manifest deadly consequences on the battlefield. Therefore, part of China's military modernization involves rooting out corruption. As part of his anti-corruption efforts after taking office, Xi Jinping initiated a crackdown in the PLA. In 2013, his first full year, 4,024 officers, including 82 generals, were investigated, with 21 being removed. The following year, 16 senior officers were investigated. Zhu Kaihu and Guo Boxiong, who were both former vice chairmen of the Central Military Commission, were investigated and jailed. Although many Western observers have wondered whether corruption in the PLA would impede China's operations the way that corruption among Russia's military ranks has, the low number of officers investigated, less than 1% of the PLA's total, likely means that it will not be as important. Xi continues to claim that anti-corruption is an important part of his military modernization program. In 2018, Xi launched a new anti-corruption drive to ensure that training data would not be falsified. Military discipline officers were sent to the Army's five theater commands to monitor drills. The drive was meant to increase the effectiveness of the PLA's training, which included frequent live-fire drills based on lessons learned from Western fighting forces, especially those of the United States. Xi has also made combat-ready training a priority for his military buildup. This objective is reflected in the PLA's frequent exercises with Russia. Before the mid-2000s, Chinese military drills with Russia were rare, amid lingering border disputes from the Cold War. Since then, they have become more frequent, with China increasingly playing a leading role in comparison to its strategic partner. Other exercises have also included far-afield drills with Iran. For example, in March 2023, the Chinese, Russian, and Iranian navies conducted naval exercises near the latter's coast. Xi's emphasis on corruption-free training is especially important if China's buildup is to succeed because the PLA has lacked real combat experience since the 1979 border war with Vietnam, where it did not perform well. Training with other forces, especially those with combat experience, is a vital component for Xi's vision of a modern, first-rate Chinese military. Even though there are lingering problems, such as a serious shortage of trained naval aviators, lack of recent combat experience, 
and certain missing components needed for long-range power projection, such as only about two dozen tankers based on 1950s Soviet designs. China's military has come a very long way in the last decade, let alone since the third Taiwan Strait crisis. At that time, China was still regarded as a military backwater, lacking in power compared to the United Kingdom, France, and even a Russia in post-Soviet transition. The PLA was often reliant on Russian technology and completely lacked the know-how to make modern equipment. That is no longer the case. The military buildup, especially under Xi Jinping, has made China a would-be regional great power in exactly the timetable that the 1997 Quadrennial Defense Review predicted. China has greater aspirations still, with Xi setting a date of 2049 to reunify with Taiwan and become the world's leading military power. But will China succeed in this goal? Or will economic, demographic and other institutional problems prevent this from occurring? Or are there many more problems under the hood for China's military? Don't forget to let us know in the comments. Also, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel for more military analysis from military experts. No one doubted the power of the United States after the end of the Cold War. China is building up its economy and military very rapidly, so sooner or later it may dare to try to shake the dominance of America in the Asia-Pacific region. Today, more and more countries in various regions have doubts about the US's strength. How will the US Navy defeat China in war? What are the other reasons that China is dangerous? Such audacity as the sea war by China requires, first of all, a very strong navy. But the US already has many other reasons to be concerned about China's capabilities. It is rapidly developing not only its navy, but also other types of military forces that are becoming competitive with the United States. But we'll get to that. Let's start with a quick overview of the US and Chinese Navy. How do they compare? The United States Navy USN remains the top naval power in the world primarily due to its potent and numerically superior nuclear-powered aircraft carrier fleet. The US Navy's carrier fleet sets it apart significantly from its regional rivals. At the forefront are 10 nuclear-powered carriers of the Nimitz class, which, while rooted in Cold War concepts and technologies, have led the service to invest heavily in the new Gerald R. Ford class. While the old Nimitz class begins to age out, these are being replaced on a one-for-one -one approach by the new Ford class supercarriers. Currently, only one of these supercarriers is in active service. Additionally, the carrier force is supplemented by straight-deck amphibious assault ships, primarily designed for rotorcraft operations, but also capable of supporting fixed-wing strike aircraft like the AV-8B and advanced F-35 VTOL aircraft. The bulk of the surface force is made up primarily of the destroyer fleet, comprising 28.8% with 70 ships. The submarine fleet follows a close second, delivering 28% of total strength for the service. The attack submarine fleet consists of all nuclear submarines, including remnants of the Cold War era like the Los Angeles, Ohio, and Sea Wolf classes, as well as the more modern Virginia-class boats, which are gradually replacing the older Los Angeles vessels. The guided missile cruiser fleet, making up 9.1% with 22 ships, also a product of the Cold War period, is slated for reinvestment with the introduction of a modern frigate design, as the current destroyer-heavy fleet lacks such vessels. The US Navy maintains a functional mine and countermine force, patrol vessels, and the historic three-masted USS Constitution, the oldest active ship afloat. The Navy also operates various support ships that streamline a wide range of naval operations. Beyond this is an aging fleet of littoral combat ships, essentially filling the category of corvettes and amphibious assault support ships. The service also invests in a capable OPV-10 ships and mine-countermine warfare fleet-8 ships, which rounds out the force rather nicely, giving broad solutions to modern battlefield problems. Hulls on order number over 65 and are set to strengthen the destroyer, submarine, carrier, frigate, and amphibious assault groups in the coming decade, attempting to keep pace with global rival China. The People's Liberation Army Navy PLAN, has achieved remarkable advancements in recent decades, significantly improving its surface and undersea vessel capabilities while expanding its support ship fleet. The number of PLAN ships is nearly twice that of the United States, with 425 ships compared to 243. The overall strength of the Chinese naval forces is now nearing parity with US capabilities more than at any previous point in history. 
an integral part of its power projection strategy, both regionally and globally, is the growing strength of its fixed-wing carrier fleet, which currently comprises three carriers. This force is set to be further reinforced by upcoming indigenous designs, providing enhanced capabilities for operating in blue water environments. The submarine fleet, constituting 16.9% of the total with 72 ships, includes vessels from various classes, and many of them still have substantial operational life, with only a few showing signs of aging. The destroyer fleet is relatively young, with 48 ships, and some of the oldest units have not yet reached 30 years in service. Similarly, the frigate fleet with 44 ships is youthful overall, with only a few exceptions, and it currently comprises more than 40 vessels. The PLAN places particular emphasis on its corvette strength, boasting approximately 70 modern vessels in this category. The mine countermine fleet composed of 49 ships, distributed across 8 units, is relatively aged, with the youngest being 27 years old. The offshore strength hulls are also approaching a critical stage in their service lives, with the 10 vessels being over 25 years old. The amphibious assault force, consisting of 11 ships, has experienced a resurgence with the introduction of modern vessels designed for helicopter and transport operations from ship to shore. China also possesses 71 corvettes and 127 offshore patrol vessels (OPVs), comprising a significant 29.9% of the fleet. Additionally, 24 vessels are on order, reinforcing the fleet's carrier, submarine, destroyer, and landing helicopter dock (LHD) categories. Overall, the PLAN has made substantial progress in enhancing its naval capabilities. China's naval modernization encompasses a wide range of initiatives, including the introduction of new ships, aircraft and weapons, improvements in maintenance and logistics, the development of naval doctrine, enhancements in fleet personnel quality, education and training of naval personnel, and extensive exercises. Its ultimate goal is to one day challenge the United States as the world's preeminent naval power. So, how close is China now? Currently, the US views the Chinese Navy as a formidable power capable of challenging American naval supremacy in the Western Pacific Ocean during a military confrontation. This presents the primary strategic dilemma for the US military since the conclusion of the Cold War. It's important to recognize that we are witnessing a pivotal juncture of global geopolitical competition. Throughout history, naval arms races and fleet competitions have consistently signaled shifts in global leadership. The competition between the US and China in terms of military capabilities, particularly within their respective navies, represents just one facet of the broader strategic rivalry, encompassing political, diplomatic, economic, technological, and ideological dimensions. The US sees the Chinese Navy as a vital element of China's efforts to challenge the United States, the predominant military power in the Pacific. Over the past 25 years, China has been actively modernizing and expanding its naval capabilities. US analysts have expressed concerns and in some instances raised alarms about the speed of growth and advancement in Chinese naval shipbuilding. They closely examine the evolving capabilities of the Chinese Navy when compared to the US Navy and conclude that the United States is gradually losing its competitive advantage. When evaluating the two competitive navies, it's essential to consider differences in ship types. The US Navy has a greater quantity of heavy ships, including aircraft carriers, guided missile cruisers and destroyers, while the Chinese Navy has a large number of light ships, such as frigates and corvettes, armed with guided missiles. Additionally, US surface warships are equipped with an extensive 9,000 vertical launch missile launchers, whereas the Chinese Navy has approximately 1,000. American warships are technologically advanced, with all the US aircraft carriers being nuclear-powered, while the first three Chinese aircraft carriers use conventional propulsion. All American submarines are nuclear-powered, while the majority of Chinese submarines rely on diesel propulsion. Most Chinese submarines are better suited for coastal operations rather than extended ocean voyages. According to the latest Pentagon report on China's military, Beijing has successfully launched its inaugural nuclear-powered guided missile submarines. This development has granted China the capability to launch attacks from both land and sea, a capability previously held primarily by American and Russian vessels. The submarines observed in Chinese shipyards over the past 18 months have been identified as Type 093B guided missile submarines. 
In the near future, the Chinese Navy will have the capacity to carry out precise, long-range strikes against land targets from submarines and surface vessels using land attack cruise missiles. This enhancement will significantly boost China's ability to project power. Some experts suggest that China's navy may deploy these submarines as supplementary assets against aircraft carriers and as platforms for land-based attacks, enabling them to strike from much greater distances than smaller attack submarines. It's anticipated that three new Chinese submarines could become operational within the next year as part of a broader expansion of the submarine fleet, encompassing both nuclear and diesel-powered vessels, which could reach a total of 65 vessels by 2025. The development of Land Attack Cruise Missiles LARCs, is a pivotal advancement for the Chinese Navy. Furthermore, China's military is on the verge of a breakthrough in making its nuclear submarines significantly quieter and more challenging for the United States and its allies to track. The number of challenges for the United States of America is increasing. American experts have identified specific areas of weakness within the Chinese Navy, including limited interoperability with other branches of the PLA forces, anti-submarine defense capabilities, long-range maritime operations, restricted at-sea resupply capabilities, and a limited number of overseas bases. There are also challenges in training a substantial number of new sailors for the crews of new ships, particularly in the absence of relevant combat experience. Chinese naval personnel are well aware of these limitations and actively work to address them. Beyond its core structure, the Chinese Navy maintains substantial reserves, with the Chinese Coast Guard ranking as the largest in East Asia. This force serves as the coastal or rear component of the Navy, and operating under a centralized mobilization system incorporates a significant number of civilian fishing vessels. In the event of a conflict with the US, anti-ship ballistic missiles play a pivotal role in China's naval capabilities. Chinese missile forces are armed with two types of medium-range anti-ship ballistic missiles, the DF-21D, boasting a range exceeding 932 miles, and the DF-26, with a maximum range of approximately 2,485 miles. Both systems are deployed on specialized mobile launchers. It's a powerful weapon. OK, China's got some mean weaponry, but does it have a plan in place for the sea war? Clearly, the primary theater of military operations would revolve around Taiwan, situated in the Western Pacific region near the South China and East China Seas. Both Washington and Beijing would regard the conflict over Taiwan a pivotal point in the Western Pacific's power balance, as a struggle for dominance in this strategically significant area. Potential Chinese strategies at the outset of the conflict China initiates a blockade of Taiwan's Matsu Islands to exert pressure on Taiwan for unification talks. Chinese ships and submarines surround various islands and islets. An array of Chinese vessels, including dredgers and fishing boats, support the encircling flotilla. Unexpectedly, the People's Liberation Army launches artillery and rocket attacks on Taiwan's army headquarters in Kinmen. As the bombardment persists, PLA landing ships carrying troops converge on Kinmen's beaches, and numerous helicopters ferry troops to secure crucial strategic positions. Taiwan's military command responds with missile strikes on ports along the Chinese coast and on PLA warships near the island. The island's air defense system also fires surface-to-air missiles at PLA aircraft over the Taiwan Strait. Taiwanese jet fighters engage Chinese fighters and bombers attacking Kinmen. Before the United States and its allies can mount a response, PLA ground forces overwhelm Kinmen's defenders. As the US and Japanese navies approach the Taiwan Strait, Beijing issues warnings about interference and prohibits ships from entering Taiwan's territorial waters without its authorization. The Chinese military deploys around Taiwan to enforce the blockade, intercepting ships, attempting to approach the island without Beijing's consent. Taiwan's efforts to maintain open ports for trade quickly succumb to the PLA's superior firepower, effectively isolating the island from the world. Beijing extends the ban on ships entering Taiwan's waters. PLA warships and aircraft are dispatched to strike positions to prevent US and Japanese forces from approaching Taiwan. US and Japanese surface combatants and submarines are deployed to the Taiwan region to break the blockade. With American long-range bombers stationed in Guam and Australia to enhance Allied firepower off the Chinese coast, US and Japanese submarines, the first to reach Taiwan, begin sinking PLA warships, thereby enforcing the blockade. 
However, China's robust air defense system and anti-ship missile batteries impede efforts to reopen Taiwanese shipping lanes and ports, while Beijing targets US bases in Japan to weaken America's ability to respond. These confrontations lead to significant losses of warships and casualties. Meanwhile, Taiwan's long-range ballistic and cruise missiles target Chinese air bases, military battery radars, and other military installations. Suddenly, the PLA launches extensive air, missile, and cyber attacks against key military and civilian targets across Taiwan, while seeking to hamper American forces and delay their intervention. China places its hopes on advanced weaponry, including the J-20 stealth aircraft, hypersonic missiles, and nuclear torpedoes. Chinese reports indicate that PRC pilots patrolling Taiwan's airspace have already begun firing YJ-21 hypersonic missiles. If the available data suggests their effectiveness, this poses a serious concern for the United States, as the debris could potentially penetrate existing defense systems. In the aftermath of the fleet's defeat, US forces may take refuge in bunkers while monitoring the situation as PLA forces carry out amphibious and airborne assaults designed to quash Taiwanese resistance. Additional US carrier groups are dispatched to Asia, and US bombers and stealth fighters launch missile strikes against PLA ships and aircraft. China can hope that by the time the United States is fully engaged in the conflict, the war may have ended up with the occupation of Taiwan. But how exactly will the US Navy defeat China in a war? The Pentagon's strategic focus increasingly centers on averting such a scenario. Its objective is to fortify and disperse the US military presence in the Asian region while developing the capacity to counteract the PLA's offensive capabilities and thwart an invading fleet. Additionally, the United States aims to encourage Taiwan to deploy asymmetric assets, including mobile anti-ship missile launchers, mines, and compact missile vessels capable of inflicting substantial damage on Chinese aggressors. This strategy is grounded in the belief that the initial weeks, if not days, of combat would be pivotal in determining the survival of a free Taiwan. Leveraging its overall military advantage, the US could swiftly mobilize ships, aircraft, and submarines from other regions to offset initial losses. It can use its supremacy in the Pacific region, beyond the first island chain, extending from Japan in the north through Taiwan to the Philippines in the south to conduct sustained assaults on Chinese forces while remaining beyond the reach of Beijing's formidable defenses. Relatively impervious assets like attack submarines and stealth aircraft can exert pressure on Chinese forces and subject them to relentless bombardment. While the concept of hypersonic weapons is attributed to China, recent events in Ukraine highlight concerns that the effectiveness of such weapons may not be as unassailable as previously believed. The US needs to mitigate the severity of a potential Chinese invasion to avoid substantial losses, relying on its global superiority. As China's momentum wanes, the US could employ strategic countermeasures. Owing to the erosion of Fang's command, a Chinese destroyer was hit by 11 American missiles and three torpedoes. Safeguarding such an attack is imperative, given that threats could originate from various directions and forms. The use of naval and aerial drones would also play a significant role thereby weakening the real power of China's fleet. The United States will disperse its aircraft from open bases, deploy marines around strategic maritime choke points, and position American submarines, some of which will be stationed near Taiwan. The core strategy for American planners encompasses three objectives, disrupting Chinese operations within the first island chain, safeguarding allies within this chain, and achieving naval and aerial supremacy beyond it. The United States faces intricate challenges, including the vast expanse of the Pacific Ocean, the expansion of China's weapons zone covering American bases in the Western Pacific, and the sheer scale of Chinese manpower and weaponry that surpasses American capabilities in various categories. For the United States, its most valuable assets lie in its long-range missiles, capable of sinking China's most prized ships and aircraft from a distance. For Taiwan, crucial armaments include short-range missiles, mortars, mines, and rocket launchers capable of decimating an invading fleet. The risk of a Chinese missile or bomber attack diminishes with increased distance, yet even Guam, a major American military hub situated 1,864 miles from China, remains vulnerable due to the inadequacy of American air defenses and the scarcity of passive defenses, such as concrete aircraft hangars. The strategy revolves around distributed lethality, 
involving the dispersal and constant movement of forces to avoid presenting an easy target while retaining the capacity to assemble and coordinate during offensive actions. American military operations would rely on joint forces, in which distinct types of troops and weapon systems complement one another. Warplanes would disperse from large bases, regroup in the air for combat, and land wherever available on patches of land. The logistics challenge would center on delivering fuel and ammunition to the necessary locations. One of the objectives of this flexible combat deployment is to compel China to deplete its sizable yet finite missile stockpile. To ensure survival, American surface vessels would likely refrain from direct combat operations near Taiwan, instead focusing on providing air defense for bases like Guam and obstructing Chinese trade. They would periodically enter and exit the danger zone to engage Chinese ships and aircraft. At the onset of a conflict, the critical task of sinking the Chinese invasion fleet, vital for Taiwan's defense, will primarily fall on submarines and long-range bombers. The United States possesses a numerical advantage in submarines, maintaining its edge in submarine warfare. These attack submarines are equipped with torpedoes, cruise missiles, and sea mines. However, they will eventually deplete their ammunition and need to retreat for resupply, rendering them vulnerable, potentially in places like Guam. Bombers operating from Hawaii, Alaska, and the continental United States will employ ammunition that can be launched from altitudes beyond the reach of Chinese anti-aircraft missiles. Nevertheless, America's long-range anti-ship missiles, with a range of 200 nautical miles or more, will likely run out within a week. Subsequently, American forces have to redeploy closer to Taiwan to engage and neutralize the enemy's ships. The hope is that China will also exhaust its long-range ammunition reserves by that point. The United States could also implement jamming techniques that are significantly more powerful than the Chinese fleet's communication signals. Through the radars on Chinese ships, targets can be detected at distances 60 times less than those achievable by their US counterparts. After an initial strike, a third of the destroyer's anti-missile defense potential would be depleted, with only half of the surface-to-surface -surface missiles capable of intercepting incoming offensive missiles. This strategy could help counter the first wave of enemy missile attacks on military bases and aircraft carrier groups. Will it represent a genuine victory for the United States? The aftermath of the early stages of the war had devastating consequences, impacting both the victors and the defeated. The Center for Strategic and International Studies CSIS, conducted simulations for nearly two dozen war scenarios. The United States and Japan faced substantial losses, including dozens of ships, hundreds of aircraft, and thousands of troops. These losses would have long-term repercussions on the U.S. global position. In most scenarios, the U.S. Navy lost two aircraft carriers and 10 to 20 significant surface combatants. Approximately 3,200 U.S. troops lost their lives in just three weeks of combat, nearly half of the casualties suffered by the U.S. in two decades of engagement in Iraq and Afghanistan. China also took a heavy toll. Its navy was decimated, its core amphibious forces suffered defeat, and tens of thousands of soldiers were taken captive. The report estimates that China would endure the loss of around 10,000 troops. 155 combat aircraft, and 138 capital ships. The outlook for Taiwan in these scenarios is grim. Even if a Chinese invasion does not succeed, despite Taiwan's resilient military, it would be left to defend a shattered economy on the island. Devoid of electricity and basic services, the island's military would face approximately 3,500 casualties, and its entire fleet of 26 destroyers and frigates would be sunk. Japan would likely lose more than 100 warplanes and 26 warships, while US military bases on Japanese soil would come under attack from China as reported. The economic costs would also be significant. In 2016, the RAND Corporation projected that a one-sided war for Taiwan would reduce China's GDP by 25 to 35 percent and America's by 5 to 10 percent. The consulting company Rhodium Group's 2022 analysis indicated that disruptions in the semiconductor supply, with Taiwan producing 90% of the world's current computer chips, would result in a global shortage of electronic goods, leading to substantial economic losses. World security and US status would be compromised. But there are other reasons that China is dangerous. Chinese nuclear weapons represent a global concern for the United States. Additionally, the challenge lies in China's ability to rapidly enhance its capabilities by acquiring more advanced weaponry. China is presently in the process of developing a new generation of submarines equipped to carry nuclear warheads. 
the integration of Russian technology is expected to significantly improve the stealth capabilities of these submarines, rendering them far more difficult to detect and track. Analysts and defense experts anticipate the completion of these advanced Type 096 nuclear submarines by the end of this decade. Naval intelligence analyst Christopher Carlson has described these new Type 096 submarines as a nightmare due to their anticipated extreme elusiveness. Another obstacle is securing air superiority for the United States. China deploys a combination of Russian-manufactured and domestically produced air defense systems, with the capacity to monitor and engage enemy aircraft. China's air defense arsenal includes the formidable Russian-built S-300 and S-400 surface-to-air missile systems, renowned for their global effectiveness. The latest versions of the S-400 and the upcoming Russian S-500 missiles are interconnected, thanks to high-speed computer processing that enables precise, long-range threat detection. These systems offer extended range and heightened sensitivity compared to their predecessors. Furthermore, China presents a potential threat through its drone capabilities. The primary goal of the United States is to force China into using its valuable missile resources to eliminate a multitude of cost-effective and easily accessible unmanned aerial vehicles UAVs. In the early stages of the conflict, China can employ a similar strategy against the limited US forces. Drones are positioned to bolster reconnaissance capabilities, neutralize air defense systems, target naval vessels, and more efficiently deplete enemy resources. China is actively progressing in its drone programs and expanding its production efforts. The outcome of a possible drone confrontation between the United States and China remains uncertain, but these unmanned systems have the capacity to yield significant advantages and disadvantages for both parties. The rise of China as a global and regional power poses significant challenges and risks for the United States. The US Navy remains a formidable force, but their victory over China would be very expensive. China's rapid military modernization in the naval domain has raised great concerns about the balance of power in the Asia-Pacific region. China's developments in nuclear submarines, advanced missile systems, and air defense capabilities have added to its overall military capability, challenging US dominance in the region. The potential for conflict in the Taiwan Strait is a main point in this competition. The US has been strategizing to counter potential Chinese aggression, emphasizing the importance of the first island chain and naval and air superiority beyond it. The simulation of various war scenarios underscores the devastating consequences of such a conflict for all parties involved, so it shows that the US should react to the current weak points in its strategy. Do you think the US can overcome challenges in the future? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts.